It's a wonderful night. It's a glorious night. It is Friday, March the 1st. The first of the month of, um, it's the first day in the month of March. How was your day today? I had a fabulous day, a fabulous day. You're watching the Marcia Week show. This is Marcia Weeks, and I'm coming to you live from Barbados, and I'm excited. I'm full of joy. Today was a day full of joy and excitement and passion and purpose. Anybody out there feel purposeful? I feel purposeful. I feel I feel full of passion and purpose and joy. It's good to know that you're doing doing what you're called to do. As I, as I told you the other night, that I know I will die empty. <laughs> I will die empty. When I die, I know that I would have poured out everything that I came here to do. How about you? I want to die empty. I'm trying to die empty. I'm trying to give everything that I have. Yes, yeah? and right now this is what's happening. This is the Marcia Week show. And as I said, we're coming to you live from Barbados, and you are locked on here. And I, I hear you, I see you when I go to the supermarket, <laughs> when I walk in town, when I'm in my garden in the front of people passing and honking the horn. I hear you, I see you, and I have a lovely story to tell you all that had me bawling today. I was crying up my eyes today. And I have to tell you all about that. You are just such a blessing to my life. Raycon, you were first on. So I have to bless you. Raycon, right, right, Raekwon Kweli. Raekwon Kweli, Sawubona. <laughs> of course, I forgot what you said it meant, that that means. Galbiz, Galbiz, and Galbiz and her entire family. I love you all. I love you all. You are Bajans to the bone. You are Bajans to the bone. You love your country and it's infectious, um, Galbiz. I feel that when I'm around you. Sandra Franklin, good night, Sandra Franklin. Good night, loyal opposition. Opposition, what do you say? Fall in line. <laughs> Don't forget that. That's our thing opposition fall in line yes 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 fx trading bb good night fx trading bb how are you ronald reach good night naira griffith good night loyal daughter 66 good night says good night loyal opposition keep on keeping on a change is about to come let's take our people to freedom land i love it you hear what I said earlier, loyal daughter 66, that it's great to have a sense of passion and purpose. And when I meet some of you in in person, I feel that. Like someone like you, I remember um, we, we've met up before. I can't call your real name. <laughs> and I feel that sense of purpose and that sense of destiny and a sense of oneness and that we are going somewhere and that this is not hype. This is about changing a nation from inside out. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Please like and share. Please like and share. Um, loyal Daughter 66, she's like our uh, one of our monitors there. And she monitors the chat and she's, she, she does it every night. She's telling you to like and share and let the show, show reach others. Hi, Marcia. Good evening. Loyal opposition blessings. I don't know if this was the same Marcia that I spoke to today that let me cry, cry, cry. Donna Steely, good evening. Yes, yes, we are. Oh Lord, yeah. Don't let me start bawling now, Diana. Don't, don't, don't do it to me, Diana. I, I, I'm bringing up the flag. I'm bringing up the flag early, Diana. You're touching me now. Yeah, she said good evening. It just dawned on me that we are fighting for independence again that's really what is happening it's freedom it is freedom when i meet the people on the street when i meet them in the supermarket when i meet them in the store when they call to they blow their horn and so what they they're happy that there is a place that they can speak out that they could speak their mind you know and that is independence <laughs> that is true independence you all Ooh, yes yes Yes, oh, that's a revelation. Thank you, Diana Seely. Ramin, Ramin 6070 says, Greetings, loyal opposition. 
the point of power is always in the present. Stand up. Push for the meaningful change in our governance today. Stand for justice. Operation Rescue and Restore BIM. Operation Rescue and Restore BIM. Loyal opposition. Loyal opposition. Let us not lose focus. Let us stay focused. We can't afford to. We can't afford to be sidetracked. We must stay focused. Oh my Lord, you all inspire me. Oh Lord, you're just all in inspirational tonight. Ian Ford, good night and greetings to all. Clive Osborne, blessed good night to all the loyal sons and daughters of this mighty opposition. For the people, by the people, onward we go with faith and courage. Did you hear the leader of the opposition um, on the radio today? And those of you who listen to him in Parliament, did you hear what he says? The man says, Mr. Thorne says, we are backing down. Loyal opposition. The leader of the opposition says what? We're not backing down. We're not quitting. We can't stop. We must go on. We must go on. Emerson Bob, good night from the UK, loyal opposition, loyal son and daughter. <laughs> oh, wow, wow. Tracy Barrow, I feel like I haven't seen you in a little bit, Tracy. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Good to see you. We are fighting for freedom. Barbados, 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 we are fighting for freedom. We are fighting for freedom and we will not stop until we have that freedom. Loyal opposition, are you with me? Are you with me? A freedom to express ourselves, a freedom to be able to speak truth. Yeah, that's it. Sir Alfred Benjamin, good night, loyal sons and daughters. Oh, locked on from Brooklyn, New York City. And that's it. Can I put in a little plug and say something about the diaspora? The diaspora, let me tell you, they are uh, a strong, strong, strong arm of this opposition. Very, very strong. I'm in constant dialogue with them. There are initiatives that they're planning for Barbados. So this is not just a talk shop. You're going to hear about it soon. You're going to hear about it soon. I can't talk about it. They tell me, shh. They said, Marcia, shh. you can't tell the people yet right but there are things that the diaspora that they're planning and that's why i am one of those that believe that they should be allowed to vote but uh thank you diaspora for logging on and you don't just log on but you join in with the with those of us living here and you're using your social media you're putting your money where your mouth is as well and you are taking action and just like all of us and and that's why i say you are part of barbados Yes, you are. I don't care if you live in Brooklyn or Germany or wherever. <laughs> okay, Judith Ann. Good night, Judith Ann. Good to see you, my sister. And we're working on that thing, Judith. We're working on it. Welcome, 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 welcome. Good night, good night, good night, Mr. Thorne and others. Keep the pressure on. Now, no stopping. Yes? Yeah, heat clip. Yes, yes, good night, Cecilia Miller. Yes, Reverend Griffith, good night, good night, good night, good night, good night. Oh, wonderful, good night, and blessings to the loyal opposition. Blessings, 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 blessings. Good to see you all, Ryan Brathwaite. Good night, good night. We're going to touch on sports tonight. We're gonna to touch on a little bit on sports tonight, and um, and so um, happy to see Ryan Brathwaite um joining us here. If it's the same Ryan Brathwaite, Liana Bell, good night. Grantley, say he's locked on. Joy and Faith, good night. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And let me just make sure that I didn't make any mistake in sending out the link. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me put that up. Let me get my disclaimer up. <laughs> thank you. I tell you, I've got some people that just, uh, they they are part of this. They are part of this. And we want to 
thank them. We want to thank them. We want to thank them. Thank you for that sister who called and messaged me and tell me to put the disclaimer up. Y'all just, y'all just want me ball. You all want me to start balling on the show tonight. Y'all just want me to start balling on the show tonight. Tonight, okay. I see my first guest getting ready. All right, so I'm excited. But you know what? <laughs> Look at Gelby's, Gelby's dancing. <laughs> That's Gelby's there, guys, in the blue dancing. That's our last march. That's Gelby's dancing. Oh, whoa. I tell you, man, we were having a ball up there. We were having a ball. Thank God they didn't catch me dancing. They catch Miss McLean dancing. They didn't catch me dancing. And Gelby's is having a ball, a ball, a ball. But at this time, we are going to, we're, what we're going to do, we're going to, um, uh play our anthem you know we play the anthem you know we're playing the anthem so let's play the anthem and then we're going to jump right in let me go ahead and do that let me go ahead and do that while you share share this is a good time to share um good time to share good time to like yes to like and share that's a good time to do that. Yes, 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 yes. our names on history's page and you know today guys i i i got a call from an 83 year old um barbadian 86 86 year old barbadian um woman and um young lady <laughs> and you know she 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 had me she had me in tears you know um just of her gratitude um, for the show and how much she has learned. And um, she asked me, she says, uh, Mrs. Weeks, I, I ask that you and the panelists, Kimar, um, Dr. Ferdinand Caswell, and that all of you, that you do not stop. She said, she said, please, please, for the sake of my country. And I heard she's 86. She said she doesn't know a lot about technology, but she happened to get it. To get it 
up and she can't like and subscribe. She doesn't know how to do any of those things, but she's locked on. And for some reason, that just broke my heart and, and it touched me. Not broke my heart. It touched me very, very deeply because I know that at that age, you know, she wants to see change. She wants to see change. And, and so I, I, I was really, really touched by that. And I must say that that was, um, that was really, really special. Now, before we bring our first guest on, Ms., um, Mrs. Marsha Hines Myrie, um, she's going to come on. Let me just say something that um, I think it's important because we talk a lot on the show about transparency and accountability and truth and so on and i try to i try my best to live my life by truth and so um there was a, a a website that was mentioned on the show last wednesday and i don't know if you remember i asked um whether the this was credible and it was a site that was speaking about something about minister wilfred abrams and i did some research after the show and realized I have come to that conclusion that I do not believe that that site is a credible site. Um, and, and so um, I just want to use this opportunity to say that to you because we, we presented it on the show and I want to um, be in terms of truth and accountability and transparency and all the good things that we stand for. Um, I want to say that I have researched the site because there's something about it that didn't, that, you know, I, I, as I said, I asked the question when it was being presented and I don't think anybody presented it, you know, um, trying to um, do anything that was, you know, let, let's leave it like that. But it wasn't something that it was, um, yeah, that's as much as I would say about that. And so... I would like for you to um, know that, all right? Because it's already out there and I wanted to use this forum that we did it on to say that as, as I thought, as I wondered about it, when I went and checked it out, the site, and I don't even want to mention the name of the site again, because it's saying a lot of things, um, you know, about Mr. Wilfred Abrams that I cannot, um, you know, I, 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 I can't verify those things. So I just want to be able to say that the site is not, uh, uh, my opinion and my research is telling me that the site is not credible, okay? All right, God bless you. All right, so now I have, I have, I see Mr. Franklin is there as well and he's getting ready and um, we are gonna have him on just after Miss, Miss, uh, Mrs. Marsha Hines Mary so he can do some commenting and we chat together. But Miss uh, Mrs. Marsha my, uh, Heinz Mary, one of my honestly, I know I know we we disagree on some things, but she's actually one of my favorite people in the world. She doesn't know it, um, but she's my namesake because Marsha Marsha I think is the Spanish for Marcia. Yeah, that's so, why I have it. My mother's name is actually Marcia. So. Um, <laughs> I'm little Marcia, Marsha. Yes, yes. So you're, you're actually one of my favorite people in the world. Why? Because of your tenacity, your fight. I've learned a lot from people like yourself and Tempu. You know, I watch from afar and I learn a lot. And I want to, I know I keep saying it, but I, I learned a lot, especially with that GIS um, situation is when I, when I came into contact with you. And this is a perfect example, Barbados. We might not agree on everything. And at some point you will hear what it is we don't agree on. <laughs> but, but I tell you something, this, I have to give her her flowers. <laughs> I appreciate you so much, Marcia. And, you know, I know that you are fighting a battle right now. You are kind of like in a, in a, in a hot seat because I know it is, you know, shows like this, uh, you know, fora like this that are under attack right now. And so I appreciate all the tight ropes that you have to walk. Um, and we don't always agree, but I also respect your tenacity um, yes. and your courage to continue to do what you're doing. And so because you started your show in the way that you did, I am foolish. I could read between the lines. Um, what I want to do now is something that I started to do in the government industrial school saga 
exactly because I understood the tight ropes that people like you were walking. And what I want to do is invoke my professional privilege, which I don't do often, but I do do it when it helps individuals like yourself. Yeah. So I want to state um, for the record that my name is Dr. Marsha Heinz Myrie. I am the activist in residence at the University of Guelph, which is a public funded institution in Canada. And unlike um, Barbados, where saying that doesn't necessarily count for something, it means that everything that I am saying now, I am willing to risk my professional reputation against. Um, because I live in a world where accountability is taken seriously, and so that kind of takes some of the pressure off of you based on what I'm going to say now, because instead of going after you, they can come after me, um, you know, because I live in the real world. Um, thank you very much for having me. And what I, what I wanted to contribute to the discussion today, the last time I was here, we talked a little bit about um, a plantation society, what that means for Barbados, um, and I want to continue that discussion tonight into some of what we see playing out in the estimates debate, um, mm -hmm. some of what our opposition leader has been able to um, unfold and help us to see and understand in the last couple of, of um, hours of the debate in the House, and, and things that I think are important discussions, right? Yes. So I am talking here about five hundred thousand Bajan dollars. I am talking about half of a million dollars. I am talking about a sum of money that I have never seen in any one place in my 23 years of activism work on behalf of women and girls in Barbados. Wow. And I want to thank the leader of the opposition for allowing us in Barbados to talk and think about what half of a million dollars in funds that are allocated for social justice movements in Barbados. I want to thank him for opening the space for us to have a discussion about what that money means and about some of the expectation that we should have for the money. I don't mudsling. I, I can, I don't, I don't want to. But what I want to talk about is issues in our country. That's, that's where I always take my analysis. And so we have the government committing half of a million Barbados dollars, 250,000 US, um, 300,000 and a little bit Canadian for helping the homeless in Barbados. Does that, is that something that we want to hear our tax dollars being spent on? Absolutely yes. But do we also have the right to ask as a society if we are getting our just deserves for that money? Also absolutely yes. And so what I want to do is kind of reflect on the sum of money tonight as one of the individuals perhaps know um, this is where I accept that I'm now an old woman um, because I am, I am one of the people that can actually reflect on that money and civil society work in Barbados uh, in a longitudinal way. I've, I've been in this thing now for, for 23 years, right? The last position that I held in Barbados in relation to civil society, as many people know, it's not a secret. I was the president of the National Organization of Women. The National Organization of Women in Barbados is an umbrella organization for women's groups in Barbados, the Barbados Mothers Union, um, a, a range of groups, uh, the uh, women's arm of the Barbados Council for the Blind, a number of groups that do women's work across Barbados. They feed the homeless, um, they provide educational programs, uh, they provide services for women who are affected by period poverty, meaning that they don't have money to buy their sanitary wares on a monthly basis. 
Uh, they provide child care, a number of services. You think about it, it's under the umbrella of the National Organization of Women. Mm -hmm. When I left the island in 2021 as the president of the National Organization of Women, mm -hmm. the subvention that the National Organization of Women of Barbados got was $1,000. That was in the years when we were paid the subvention. You mean so, like in, in 2021? In 2021. Back in 2021, when I was the president of the organization, our official subvention we are an umbrella body. We're not one group, okay? The umbrella body for women's groups in Barbados that has been constituted since 1972 was receiving a subvention of a thousand Barbadian dollars, mm -hmm. 500 US, 300 and something Canadian dollars. So we are talking tonight about a subvention to a group of $500,000 in the context of women's groups in Barbados receiving a subvention of a thousand Barbados dollars. I don't come to any show to talk about things that people tell me about. I come to share my experiences, okay? I, these are experiences, like I said, that I am willing to put my professional reputation against. And so the question has to be, how is it that feeding the homeless in Barbados, whoever is doing it, however they are doing it, how does it receive a subvention of $500,000 when the National Organization of Women, which is a collective of women's groups across the island, is only getting a subvention of $1,000. I want to go further because we know that much of what I am saying now is also contextualized by the government industrial saga. I'm still all right with that. I'm still all right with my face and my name always invoking the experience of the government industrial school and what we recently went through in this country. So the question has to be asked, for this $500,000 that we have just spent on homelessness in Barbados, one of the issues that actually results in children being placed in the government industrial school is housing instability and homelessness. Uh -huh. So the question, a reasonable question to ask is, this $500,000, that is Barbados $1,000 annually. That is not monthly. That is not bi-monthly. It is not quarterly. It is one thousand dollars annually annually the national organization of women that is our government subvention up to 2021 when i left as the president of the organization okay i feel like if it had changed between now and between then and now i would have known so i'm putting it on the table a thousand dollars annually but let me get back to the point that i was making many of those children who end up in the government industrial school end up there through housing instability or you know homelessness mm -hmm. so my question is the five hundred thousand dollars that we just spent of taxpayer money have we designated within that sum of money a sum of money that is particularly dedicated to youth homelessness and youth Mm. housing instability there are girl children in this society well i'm saying this because i hear my idea right yeah. there are girl children who live in barbados who run from family environments to stop getting trouble that's let true talk. let me talk we ain't got nothing to hide on this show we come to talk frankly to each other that has run away from getting trouble the brother the uncle, the stepfather, the own father, they run, right? And they end up 
all across the place in unsafe situations, whatever. And because they don't have that anchor, they end up in the government industrial school. So we have just spent $500,000. But we still don't have a solution for them, you know. We still don't have a solution for them. But I hear in people now turning this conversation into, oh, the opposition leader trying to be political. He tried to be political. He shouldn't, he shouldn't attack this body. He shouldn't attack. No. All of the issues that he has put on the table are important issues. They're issues that I myself have tried to draw to the attention of the current sitting minister that is responsible for these issues. So the government industrial school children, housing instability for those children has still not been addressed. Okay? Let's go now to a more, cause I know the people in Barbados say I always talking for the women. But at the end of the day, according to the 2010 census, which is still the most recent census that we have for Barbados, the people of Barbados really need to start to ask their government, where is the current census? Because of 2010, a census is supposed to be done every 10 years. When it was supposed to be renewed, we were in COVID. I accept that. But we are now also two years past COVID. So the people of Barbados have to start asking, where is the census data uh -huh. for Barbados right now? But Correct. according to the 2010 census, which is the last census, the last complete census that we have, there are more women that live in Barbados than men. When the men in Barbados are ready to harm you, there's no very good that they got more women than men. <laughs> and, every, and every woman can get you a man. Right? When we're talking about homelessness, we also have to remember that there are more women that live in Barbados than men. And if we are expending half a million dollars of government resources, there has to be an answer in that pie for women. But the current shelter that we have for homelessness in Barbados has a series of flights of stairs such that pregnant women that I have had, okay, cannot go to that shelter because to climb those stairs is labor inducing. Mm. Right? I, I, I am not here to attack any one group, any one person. I am talking about a policy position. Yes. I am talking about the decisions that we make with our taxpayer dollar that affect the taxpayers of Barbados, most of whom are women. Because I just told you, more women than men live in Barbados, right? So pregnant women, apparently in Barbados, cannot become ho homeless. Because if they become homeless, they cannot be served. Women with children in Barbados cannot yes. become homeless. Because as we saw play out a couple of weeks ago, if you are a homeless woman in Barbados, your children have to be taken from you. Yes, because although we have spent half a million dollars on the problem of homelessness in Barbados, we still have no place in Barbados that can cater to a homeless family. There are some families in Barbados that are homeless. It is not just men. It is not just single people. Well, one one second. Uh, I, I think this is an important question, and I, I I'm I, I'm gonna um I, I I'm deliberately asking you to address this question, um here. And I know Miss Mister Franklin is sitting there, and when we're ready, he's going to um be asking some some questions as well. Um, but this person is asking this, and I I I I want I, I I'm sure you've read it. Yes. And I want you to, she, he said, hasn't the government over the years provided facilities for women? Really? Which means All they right. pay bills, et cetera, unlike the homeless center. Let me let, let, me let the professional answer it and not, and not me because I, 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 you know, go ahead. Um. All right. So the person looking at my notes now and bringing me on to the, to the third point that I wanted to make. But let me ask the let me ask the question in the way that it was. Let me answer the question in the way that it would it was asked, so that the person understands. The government has provided facilities for certain classes of women, meaning that 
There is another shelter in Barbados mm. that caters for battered women. Yes. So women who have to run for their safety and need to be rehoused. And that shelter does receive a subvention from the government. Let us be clear that every woman in Barbados who is homeless is not homeless because of intimate partner violence. Many women in Barbados are homeless because of the ways that our economy is shifting, because of the ways that our court don't, uh, don't ask or require men to play child support. Um, they, they have the same issues of mental wellness, illness, addiction that men have. So if I am a person who is struggling with mental wellness needs and addiction, for example, I cannot, I am not received in the shelter for battered women because I am not a battered woman. I'm a woman with other needs mm -hmm. that lead me to homelessness. So while there is a shelter for battered women, which also receives subventions from the government, that is not the only reason that women in Barbados become homeless. That shelter is not the solution for a girl child who runs from sexual abuse in her family and becomes homeless in that way. But I'm glad for that question because it brings us, it brings me now to the third thing that I want to put on the table that is concerning about this half million dollar subvention, 500,000 whole dollars, enough money. I've never seen all of that in one place in my advocacy years in Barbados. If I had, I would have changed the world. I promise you, I would have changed the world. I want to open a shelter, I would have changed the world, right? There is no legislative framework in Barbados that governs shelters. The battered women shelter, the shelter for homelessness, there is no legislative framework 2024 2024 so if i go to the shelter as a homeless person in barbados and i fall down a flight of stairs and i break my back there is no legislative framework that governs why I was in a shelter, what I should do now, who I should put in my claim, no legislative framework, none. There is no legislative framework that governs how the individuals that are in that shelter, employed, volunteer, whatever, however, should interact with me, how I should interact with them, what is too much, what is not enough, if I go and I have a great experience, how is that recorded? If I go and I have a horrible experience, how is that recorded? These are issues that I try to draw to the attention of the Honorable Kirk Humphrey sometime around October or November last year. He graced me with two meetings, full public disclosure. I don't have nothing to hide. And I told the minister my concerns at the time. I told him my concerns, not only about the shelter that is under scrutiny at this point in time, but the fact that, like I said, across Barbados, I could decide tomorrow, I could decide, you know what, Canada too hard for me. There's too much, there's too much accountability, too much truth, too much real world. I come along back home. But you know what, I can't pay my mortgage. I got a room downstairs my house. I go up in a shelter. It literally is as easy as that in Barbados. I come back home and I can't make it night away. I open a shelter. And then if I'm friends enough with the government, remember the patronage that we were talking about in this plantation society and how it works. If I could get a little somebody to wink at me and allow me to get a subvention, I got a shelter. I got shelter plus government resources. That's what's going on in Barbados. But you have groups in Barbados that have been operating 1972 plus, plus um, 
1972 to, to 2004, as the woman on TV used to say, we're dying a little bit of years. And we only qualify for $1,000 out of the pie. But somebody coming now and getting a half million out of the pie. We have to contextualize it that way. I do not want Barbadians to lose the script. This is not about an individual. This is about how our tax dollar in Barbados is spent. This is about the communities in Barbados that are seen as deserving and the ones that are seen as undeserving. Anywhere you go in Barbados and you are a deserving person and you get service that you don't like, you are able to complain. We put patient advocates inside the Queen Elizabeth Hospital for all the good, the bad, the ugly you could at least have somebody to complain to and say, listen, but when they left me down here for four hours and when they come back and somebody have to at least come and say, oh, shoot, sorry. Um, let me go and see what's going on. What about the shelters? Do we have patient advocates in the shelters? Do we have clear advocates? But, but, in the most of these, but most of these shelters, um, educate me, please. But most of these, as far as I, I think, most of them are privately run, aren't they? They are privately run. And there is no legislative framework. So now you understanding. I go and I deal with a private entity. The government is putting money in the private entity, right? When you talk about, uh, I hear all, uh, the whole week, oh, we, we, we send our financials to Kaipo. Management and accountability is more than financials. It has more to do than financials. It is about how do people lodge a complaint? It is about what is the minimum standard of service. It is about if I don't get that minimum service, okay. th that minimum standard of service, where do I complain to? It is about how can I see the credentials of the individuals in this organization that are serving me? Can they, how, when is the last time the psychologist did a continuous professional development? What, what kind of psychologist is it? Because we have different kinds of psychologists. Is it a psychologist with a specialization in homelessness? Does the person have a specialization in, um, and I, I, I hear us talking about homelessness. We move on from that term so long ago in the world. We talk about unhoused individuals because every individual who shows up in a space like a shelter is not homeless. Some of them actually leave homes. They don't want to be in the homes. Right. So we use different terminology is what is that person's specialization? When we talk about a full account of the space, mm -hmm. all of these things are there for everybody to scrutinize. It is more than finance. The finance is an important part because if um, what's her face, the, the, the official lady who feeds homeless, if she is able to feed 300 people, with $2,000, we can use that as a scale to think and know what you should be able to do with 500,000. So the finances is also a part of it. But in addition to the finances, there are other things that are important that yes. we don't have any access to. The legislative framework is not there. I had a client a couple of uh, two, I'm going to give you two examples to show what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. I had a client who um, was known to a hospital in Barbados and was on some medication. Mm -hmm. And that individual ended up interacting with one of the shelters in Barbados. For whatever reason, their prescription did not follow them to the shelter. OK, and the reason why that happens is because there is no intake process at the shelters currently in Barbados. I could talk these things freely because everything I said in on here, I'm telling you now, I have spoken to Kurt Humphrey. I've told him these are my concerns. But nobody in Barbados, I'm just a, I, I'm a troublemaker. I can make trouble till I'm dead. A Barbados can't get rid of me because I'm born day. All right. People like, oh, um, oh, wait, you don't live here no more. My birth certificate said they. They can't get rid of me. They will never silence me. Yes, I'm a major. Can't get rid of me. Can't report me. Can't deport me. Can't do nothing. I will talk till I die. Amen. I said to Mr. Humphrey, I said to Minister Humphrey, 
What is the intake process? For the shelters in Barbados, how do you intake people? An intake form is a basic informational form. Your name, your address, pre presenting symptoms, um, treatment plan, basic information. I had a client that went to a shelter in Barbados and went without critical information until, went without critical medication until they started to act strange. And when they start to act strange, everybody realizes, oh shoot, oh shoot, oh shoot, oh shoot. We don't, want, we don't want them here, we don't want them here, we don't want them here. How is that possible? Mm -hmm. I said to Minister Humphrey, we have a problem. We need to make sure that we are able to cater to people's needs. That's one, right? That's one. The next one, is and you might not agree with this one marcia but i had a woman the woman is is butch presenting we don't want we don't like to talk about these things in barbados but these things are real she is butch presenting she was offered you run you don't have nothing you don't have no like clothes you don't have no dignity as people your clothes are your dignity the only thing that hide in my nakedness is my clothes clothes are important right but how I hide my clothes also has a lot to do with how I feel comfortable about myself, right? So she was offered a nightgown, but she's a butch woman. She don't want a nightgown, she want pajamas. So she said, this is not comfortable for me. I would like pajamas, not a nightgown. She get put out. She get put out because the response to her was, you should be thankful. You ain't had nothing and now we get something. You should be thankful. So because I am homeless, because I have no, nowhere else to turn, you can do me anything, you can treat me any way, that is not dignity. My grandmother used to tell me, better to be hungry and to be silent than to open your mouth unless somebody yeah. make a shame. My grandmother used to tell me so. I don't know when the boy else grandmother used to tell them, but my grandmother used to tell me so, right? So these are issues that we need to deal with in terms of how homeless people are treated, what they are offered to eat. Bread and cheese every day cannot be that. It is not a balanced diet, especially when you're spending half a million dollars of the government money. We mm -hmm. want a balanced meal. We want to see some lettuce. We want to see some tomato. None of this is covered. None of this is, 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 is catered for anywhere. And yeah. so these are the issues that Ralph Thorne is ventilating. Mm -hmm. And we, the loyal opposition, have to assist him. I yeah. can shut up now because you gave me 20 minutes and I'm very <laughs> grateful for it. I'm not going to go over. But these are, I just you're right on time. You, you did it right on time. You, you're right at the, at the time. Well, yes. Marsha, this has been very um, uh, educational, looking at it from a holistic standpoint and not um you know um putting you know throwing anybody under the bus but looking at it as a holistic um from a, a you know because I, I i i don't you know i'm not as involved as you are in a lot of this social with social issues mr um uh caswell franklin is even more into in involved than i am people like winston and so on and i know that homelessness among women um is also that that is a big issue that i i have often we we sat down and thought, how could we, you know, um, you know, make one part of our school, uh, you know, just so women, so they, it's just an issue. Um, you it know, is an issue, and if you are putting out homeless people during the day, mm -hmm. if you are not running, um, and you know, a twenty-four hour facility, whatever, then the question is, if I have my mints and I have to leave during the day, where do I change my sanitary wear? Mm -hmm. How do I get sanitary wear? I am not saying that these are not things that are catered for. I am saying that these are things that when I asked questions about, mm -hmm. were not answered. Yeah. I, I'm not here to accuse anybody. I ain't trying to, I don't mudsling. I'm not interested. I don't have time for that. But what I'm saying is this conversation that we are having in this nation tonight, I can dismiss as just a political conversation because there are concerns and there are outstanding matters that we still have to deal with. Yes, thank you. Um, in fairness, someone here is saying um, square four, which I do know this as well. And then I'm going to, Mr. Franklin, um, just getting get ready to jump in. Um, square four is, is saying a homeless shelter has to be run with money. 
And I, I run a charity, so I know that it's true with light and water, bill, water bills each month, food, bedding, payment of any work to the shelter, that organization. I, I don't understand the rest of it, but, um, but you know, well, Mr. Franklin, what are your general thoughts um, about this uh, particular um, issue? Um, good night, and good um, night. thanks again for being here. I... I love coming on this show because it gives me opportunity to vent there's so many things that i see you know and marcia is saying that she had 20 minutes and she don't want over the time marcia i could listen to you for the full three hours you know <laughs> honestly you know because you're not talking nonsense and just just to help you with some of your thing i, I have with me here you know i always like my documents People always Mr. Franklin, let, let me let me say something, right? That um, we we're trying our best not to offload on individuals, all right? So I you know, we're not. I'm not offloading anybody. Okay, good. Go ahead. I, I I'm saying to Marcia that um, the the amount of money under the sub program Bureau of Gender Affairs in the estimates this year for all the women's organizations and stuff and, and men know too because the men is gender it's under it's um item sub program zero four three eight gender affairs and the thing is four hundred and twenty thousand dollars for everybody so homeless let's get more than we you get more than everybody else put together. Oh, hold a minute. Let's clarify that for some of us who, who are a little slow. So you're the bureau. That... The bureau of gender affairs is the focal point within the government mechanism. Um, for sorry, it's four hundred eighty-one. Sorry, four hundred eighty-one. So just, just a little thousand. less. Just a little. Uh, what what is that? Nineteen thousand dollars less than what has been put but into the the one organization. Shelter. One organization. So, exactly. so, and and people accuse the. Leading the opposition to be political. This that is so farcical and so funny. Uh, the opposition got be political. So wait. So let me go back and answer the question that Marcy is asking. The Bureau of Gender Affairs was uh, one of the mechanisms that came out of the decade of women, the UN decade of women, which was recognized from 1970, the end of 1974 to sometime in 1985. And what it was, was a recognition by the United Nations that women's experiences of life um, were different and that they needed to be catered for and embedded within governmental apparatus. Mm -hmm. In the Caribbean, um, the Bureau of Gender Affairs, the, it was first the Bureau of Women's Affairs was one of the important points um, for being able to coordinate and respond to the needs of women coming out of the UN decade of women. We have um, evolved to the point where we are not now only looking at the needs of women, but we're also looking at, you know, different gender representations, the queer community, um, you know, and how those individuals are impacted. In the Caribbean, because we still live in a very uh, patriarchal society, the men in the Caribbean have been able to make representation for their rights to also be recognized within gender bureaus. Mm -hmm. And that is a whole nother conversation. Okay. So I, I get the picture. I think get, I get, right. I get, I get the, the picture. Yes. Okay. So uh, 481,000, which is where the National Organization of Women, I guess, would fall um, under there somewhere. With their, um, with their yes and no. Yes and no. We do we do fall under uh, the 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 Bureau of Gender Affairs for some things, but again, it goes back to what I was saying before. Because there is no strong and clear legislative framework that governs civil society in Barbados and the work of civil society in Barbados, it, it, it floats. So remember, Minister Colin Jordan is the Minister of Labour and the Third Sector. Mm -hmm. Right. That third sector is really these civil society organizations. Uh, again, just before I left Barbados, there was a group that used to meet. Um, we used to meet monthly. It was like a table of uh, civil society groups. 
and it, it it fed into our social partnership because remember he's also the minister of social i think he's the minister of labor social partnership in the third sector something like that as well you can help me um so for some of it we fall on the gender for some of it we fall on the minister there is no clear cogent um legislative firm framework that governs civil society um and we have tried to do some tinkering so you heard a lot like i said made this week of presenting financials to Kaipo and that kind of thing. But there are a lot of things that are problematic about that Kaipo demand on civil society, a lot of ways in which it disadvantages um, uh, community groups, you know, sure. groups in the, in the community that, that just spring up a football club, a cricket club, things that are very important to our culture. Marcia, you, you know yourself, you know yourself. You're talking, I can tell you that that is a, that is a fact right and so and so you know you're asking where we fall we fall everywhere and nowhere we fall right. according to where the 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 uh political directorate wants us to fall when it is uh advantageous to but, them but but suffice to say uh mr franklin brought a very within the estimates because this conversation came out of the estimates that the leader of opposition yep. mm -hmm. um brought to us and he was asking questions really um and um 481,000 um that for is the for the entire bureau of gender of affairs, gender affairs. But and then 500,000 for a single entity for, it's, for problematic. A single entity. it's problematic yeah, it's problematic i see i can understand what you mean yeah. um which has nothing to do with um accounting that's uh, that's not the issue you are raising in on in, on this particular point um mm -hmm. mr franklin was you had something else you were going to say sir yes i am um... I was going to say to you, next year, they project that they will give you $100,000 less. It, next year, is projected to be $381,800. Just exactly $100,000 less than they're giving you this year. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't know that you people, you know, and the other agencies, it says here, grants to nonprofit organizations. Well, I don't make any profit. I better ask for some. Uh, <laughs> you know, seriously, though, this money, I was offended when I heard it. I wasn't offended because Ralph spoke about it. I was offended because the government seemed to think that they can give the money to their supporters and get away with it. Because um, while um, we were discussing last night, Oh, well, not last night, you know what I mean, the night before. Someone sent me a receipt from another BLP charity that they get $100,000. This is just one, right? And the, this is, and mind you, this is a BLP person who sent it to me because they too are offended. I was surprised that that person would send me anything dealing with the Babylon Labour Party. But so they're appear, saying that they're saying that their charity only got a hundred thousand. No, this is this is another charity uh -huh. that got a hundred thousand. He is not part of it. He's not part of that charity. But he knows about it and he had the documents that he was able then to take a picture and send it to my phone. Yeah. And I say, well look, you know, and that charity another charity that got a hundred thousand dollars of government money. Yes. With, with no transparency, you know, these things just happen. I, if I were supporting Barbers, they were party, I could set up a charity too. And next thing you know, I could be getting 500,000, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And when it, it, I, you said, I, I don't want to get down to names, calling, and stuff, but it, it is important because the same person wrote to me and said, that this person was was, was Santia's campaign manager in the last election. So these are these are allegations. So let no let's... no no. I have that confirmed. Okay. So right? okay. So okay. So um, and he is camp campaigning for. He's been campaigning for a seat to get a constituency to run in. I think I, I think how we how we can get away from how we can keep Marcia safe because we do have to keep Marcia safe mm -hmm. 
is to bring it back to this conversation about patronage within our political system. Yes, that, that is all that it is, Marcia. It is it, it, you, it you, is you give to your friends. So you you have we we do away with the massa, right? And the political party replaced massa. So all the power that massa had is now bestowed in the political party. And who the, is you know, kind of like what Granny used to say about the cap. Same thing with the political party. Who he like, he lick, and who he hate, he kick. Right? We don't have to call names because at the end of the day, it happens across all of the political parties. Yeah. And right. it is the reason why we have the loyal opposition now. And it is one of the issues that we have to confront if we're talking about how can we change politics in Barbados and how we approach mm. politics in Barbados, right? If I'm, an institution, sorry, Caswell, you go. I'm sorry. Yeah. You, no, you sorry. Go. No, I, I, um, I want to draw some people's attention to a lot of things when it comes to government and government priorities. Mm -hmm. We had a situation where nurses at the geriatric hospital, I cannot speak to the other geriatric hospital, I don't know that for a fact, I know this for a fact, would go down to S.Y. Adam in Bridgetown and buy washcloths so they can bathe um, the patients because they may have none. And government would not provide things like that for yeah. patients, in-house patients, not people that leave up mornings and come back by night, in-house patients. And you, you, and you can tell me that you can find $500,000 and you can't find $10 to buy a few washcloths for S.Y. Adam. You know, nurses actually go into their pockets and buy um, toiletries for patients because some patients and 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 this is why i i have a difficulty with government and government policy when it comes to um handling the elderly when i was a boy almost every parish had what used to call in those days an arms house and they have systematically closed them down and put a lot and then allowed people to set up child um, homes for old people and government pays some of that money but the feet the, 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 the diets are not good in a lot, a lot of them and some of the, and some of the people are physically abused i even saw some, a, a person on, on uh, one of my whatsapp messages that's getting all bad and cursing last night saying but if the body she saw how they treat the person if she, she can kind of drop kick them and all kind of stuff she cursed really bad i can't use those languages and <laughs> anything but the, a lot of them are treated badly government wants to get out of taking care of the people who made who made this country what it is mm -hmm. right and all of a sudden they're not important to us they might not be important to you because you never had an old mother or you never had an old father you know or you don't care if you had one but it matters to people like me because i would prefer to see my money being spent on the old people who work and, li and labored hard to make my best what it is rather than farm out in people's um houses and, and close down the district hospitals now when you so the people who are not fortunate enough to get into these homes are not unfortunate enough in some cases to get into one of these homes they go to the different geriatric hospitals um the st thomas one they close that down um just not just last year the um there is still st philip st lucy and um St. Michael's District Hospital that they call the Geriatric Hospital. Now, if you come from St. Lucie, when I was a boy, I'm talking about when I was a boy, if you were too old and, and, and you realized you could take care of yourself, you used to march yourself down to the um, house and the matron would take in. Yeah. Now you have to go through a whole process of people doing all kinds of testing and all kinds of stuff. Sometimes the people die before they go into the, into the homes. And then they put you in the one that has a bed available. So you are now a person from St. Peter, but you they're going to place in St. Peter to put you, so they put you in the Jared Hospital and, 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 and um, Beckles Road. Uh -huh. Now, your relatives can't get down there to look for you, bring a little sour salt punch or anything like that for you. Nothing so. So many people, so the, the, so, and sometimes, if, if they can't get down to you, they might have been bringing washcloths and things. I've no been, I, I, I talk about experience because I used to go into the district hospital. I used to play games with the old people at St. Thomas District Hospital. 
I used to play dominoes. I used to throw the ball that I uh, am um, the old women and then catch it and stuff. I used to do all that kind of stuff when I was much younger. And I even had a blind woman catching. I used to bounce the ball on the chest and she would catch her hand. Nana. You know, and <laughs> so, but they, they don't do that anymore. They just store them. I thought, I, I, don't, I don't think it is, and, and it, I call it storing. They yeah. Put them in some place and, and, um, and store them. They don't, it, the government doesn't care. It's just government wants to get them away from the, from the thing. So the government is responsible for the problem. And that is why you have um, a lot of elders abandoned at the hospital. They go to the hospital, they, they are treated, but if I get a bit seen, I don't know. You can't leave your home in the house because when you come back, you can only find the fire service there. And a few police stand up looking to see what happened, and your mother, they just perish. So they're going to go to the hospital. They leave. They just they don't take. They don't take them back up because you you cannot no mind that old person. Yeah. You know, you know because in in the in the old days again, the fathers work, the mothers stay at home for the most part. No, and the mother will take care of the two the two old ladies, her mother and the father's mother. No, you have a situation where both people have to work in order to eat the wife pay the light bill the husband buy the food somebody else pay the mortgage you know that that kind of thing because it need you know take two salaries to run a household unless you're the prime minister you get that kind of money and then you can always eat in parliament or always get entertained so you don't have to spend that but if you are the average fellow out there you have to cut and contrive you know when, when i first started to work i got 350 dollars a month i had so much money i didn't know what to do with it you know so i had a couple of girlfriends i i just want to say i just want to say um here caswell i i understand what you're saying about you know you going to the homes and interacting with with the um elderly and that kind of thing and i sit here and i'm trying to balance i'm trying to balance preserving the aspects of Barbadian culture that have served us well with best practice international standards, right? So I understand that preserving the bonds that you're talking about with the elderly where, you know, people can go into the home in the evening, volunteer, it is valuable. I'm not taking that away. And there's also a part of me that is thinking about the requirements for working with vulnerable communities in a place like Canada. So I am a part of um, the anti-black racism group at the Pickering Public Library. I am not um, public facing. So meaning nobody that comes to the library interacts with me. I just sit in a room, you know, every couple of months and we go through the different experiences of the library that black people have to kind of act as a checkpoint to make sure that you know we're living up to the dei commitments that the government has made at the federal provincial level whatever in order to interact with that work in order to do that work i have to subject myself to what is called a vulnerable police check which is where the government and um, they take my fingerprints um, and they check across the world to make sure that there are no charges against me of impropriety with children, the elderly, you know. So, so I am vetted to make sure that I am no harm to, because the library is a space that vulnerable people use. But imagine that you have shelters that are constructed in Barbados for vulnerable people. And you got the mongoose in the hen house. You got the mongoose in the hen house. Some of the biggest abusers in Barbados frequent these places where vulnerable people are receiving services. They use it as their personal dating site. They use it as all kinds of things because there is not one single check and balance. Check and balance. You know, as as Mr. Franklin said, we could go on the entire night and we, we could. what we need to do is to um we, we need to we will talk, um, Marsha, because this is so important because we see what happened, the video that Mr. Franklin was talking about, the elderly. 
and there's a lot of money and a lot of a lot of lot a lot more needs to be done in that area i spoke to the 86 year old woman um today elderly woman and she asked me about that you know um and, and she, there's an idea that she shared with me i would share with you guys off air um yes. that at 86 as i told you i was weeping when i was finished talking to her today and so these are real issues and they so are. i don't think that you are saying uh marcia as we close this segment that you're saying that homelessness is not important but you're you're i believe what you're saying is that let's look at the whole let's look at the whole and and let's not you know for what we need a legislative framework because it's not just the center for the homeless we also have two shelters in barbados that deal with addiction and yes. up to just before i left barbados in 2020 where i fought for the first time for a woman with addiction issues not to be separated from her child you had a situation in barbados where a woman who was uh drug dependent was separated she was forced to, to send her child to the child care board while she received therapy and some of the mothers in barbados will tell you that they never see their child since then or couldn't get it back out of the system that is not an international best practice when you are treating a mother for addiction issues you do not separate her from her children but again there's no legislative framework so those are the issues that i think ralph gave us space to talk about Yes. That are important issues. Oh, Marcia, yes. no, no, don't go yet. Well, addiction is an illness. Addiction is it an is. illness. Yes. Just like the flu. You know, suppose you got the flu and tell your children. But, 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 you but that's I, what we still I, do. You, you, you tell them, this what happened. Mr. Franklin and Marcia, can we agree that we're going to come back on? And the, I know, I, I know, because it, it's yes, getting yes. to me as well. I can yes. see as well. We, we, have to, we have serious issues. And as, as Marcia says, that um mr ralph thorne the leader of the opposition has opened the door for us to have these kinds of discussions and i think that that is great marcia let me thank you because right. as well we keep you here the entire night <laughs> so um so we, you have to come back let's work it out um and we will come back and, and discuss we didn't even get to talk about the book the, the launch you know we, but we, we, i'm going to talk about it tonight and then you come back on all right for sure god bless Bye -bye. You. thank you so very very much god bless you Wow, that was very, very insightful, very interesting way of looking at it without singling out an, 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 an individual. And let me just say, um, you know, that I did try to reach out, because not because of this show in particular, but I must say in, in, in trying to be transparent and truthful, um, I did try to reach out to Mr. Kimar Safri, not because of anything said in this show, but because of the last show, to see if we can have a discussion. I know her that he was on brass tax and answered a lot of the questions on brass tax. Um, he was also on Kimar's alternate view, so people can um, look for that online, um, you know, and, and listen to what he has to say. I did not get him. Probably the number that I had is not the correct number, but I did. I tried three times and did not get him. So in in um, being transparent. Uh, with with everybody but mr franklin we have we have to move on to another segment here and um it was not in the estimates but i know it's going to come up and this has to do with with sports um and and we just have a few minutes about 10 minutes mr bob alwin bob is here and there's something that i saw going around and because it has mm -hmm. People, I kind of dragged it into the show, and this has to do with a young woman, Tyra. Um, Trotman. Trotman. yes, yeah, thank you, Mr. Bob. Tyra Trotman, um, a young lawyer, um, she had put she put out a video, she's from the Democratic Labour Party, um, and she, she she put out a video, um, speaking about the stadium. <coughs> And she was asking, where is the money? And what happened was that these people took the, the video and they made a mockery of it and said, she doesn't know what she's talking about. She's talking nonsense and so on. And the essence of that video that Tyra um, Trotman um, had put out was really saying um, to me, what I understood from it was the, the, the children now, we have not sat, we have all of these athletic um you know um competitions but they don't have anywhere to um you know to stage these competitions we're seeing 
or our big athletes. You know, we have great athletes, and they they can really train in Barbados. There's nowhere the, the stadium is still there, and so I believe that the essence of what Tyra was saying was, um, listen, what has happened to the stadium? Are we going to get another stadium? She said, where are the money gone? But they're saying, well, it wasn't a loan, it's a grant. So Tyra is talking nonsense. I thought to call Mr. Babon for a few minutes um, before we get back to the estimate to talk to us about the stadium and what is happening there. Good night. Hi, good, good night, um, Marcia. Good night to all the listeners as well. And um, I, I sat and listened to you talking about homelessness. The track and field are homeless too. And our place of competition has no roof and no flooring. So we don't have a track for a lot of years. And today, Ms. Trotman tried to get to the issue to Barbadian public in a way which we understood that this has been going on to, for too long. But like everything else in Barbados, once you ask questions of this government, they seek to attack you. Mm -hmm. They seek to discredit you in a lot of ways. And it has to stop. We have a right in Barbados to ask questions about money, whether it is a grant or whether it is a loan, there was money. Over the period of time that we had the money, which is $40 million, whether it was grant or not, that is not the question. It is when you are going to use that grant or loan to start the stadium. Those are the questions that we should have heard answered today. Instead of trying to discredit Ms. Trotman and bring a, uh, attention to a matter that has been going on for too long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it is that the the um, a, a new stadium was promised, um, and they are saying that they nobody promised a stadium by January um, 2024. Not that we didn't need it, <laughs> because we know I've not said and we have all of these different things. But they're saying that um, those that are you know trying to to um, beat her up on social media, they are saying that it was not a grant, it was not a loan, it was a, it was a grant. So therefore, her asking where is the money, it is, you know, that she should didn't have to ask her. But can you tell us, what, what are some of, without the stadium right now, you're a coach, Mr. Trump, Mr. Bob, you're a coach. What are, what, tell me what, some of the challenges that you have as a head coach here in Barbados without a national stadium. This weekend, we are having junior national championships, and this is what we have to face as a coach. I coach jumps, throws, and track. The track section is happening at St. George. Mm -hmm. The field event section, the throwing section, is going to Coldrange to Parry in the north. Tell me, as a coach, how am I going to split that time between athletes that need attention to get to the from the north to get from the north to St. George. Mm. It's called cloning. <laughs> Those are the type of things that we're issue that we are faced with. Then we, we are a nation which does which did exceptionally well, performed well in hurdles. Yes, this is March. Can I put in a plug for you? This is one of the, uh, in the region, this is one of the best, um, one of the better um, hurdle coaches, Mr. Tuck, Mr. Franklin. Uh, it's Mr. Bob. I know that as a fact, but go ahead. It is an event that requires level surfaces. You cannot hurdle on grass because we know the condition of our fields in Barbados. And now that we are right into the dry season, the cracks are showing even bigger. So we have young hurdlers who are looking to develop cannot compete in hurdles because there is no track. We, the stadium still remain the best venue for throwing javelin and shot put. Mm -hmm. But right in the midst of the, the season, you place a hospital inside the stadium. That is why we are going around at different grounds. The National Association is trying its best to to assist athletes and coaches in by providing transportation. But when you have that, that volume of athletes, they're, they're saying to me today in, a, um, in an email that only 14 people can be accommodated at any given point in time for transportation to Corrigan Parry. And then when I leave Corrigan Parry, 
public transportation and being transported back to the stadium to try to make my way to St. George to meet the other athletes. That is what we are faced with. And instead of ask, I trying to discredit some person for asking about money, whether it's a loan or grant, tell us when you're going to start the stadium and tell us why that there is a trap in Barbados that could have been laid at the national stadium, set up a tent, set up the same tent situation. Why is it still lying in a in a, con a container? And when you leave a trap in in a container in these kind of conditions, when you take it out, it is of no use whatsoever. Hold a minute, so you you skip over a lot there. You heard that, Mister Franklin? You're saying yes, that I heard is, it. you're saying there's a trap that they bought for the stadium that is in a container and, and have been sitting there for how long? For since last year or even longer. Wow. When when we started to keep a lot of noise, they went to Vildi, cleared off some land. The noise died down. The grass grew back up. When the noise started again, they cleared it off. But nobody can tell us when they're going to lay the trap at Vildi mm -hmm. or if they're going to put that trap at the stadium. Because in all the, the, the video that they put out, today they did not say when they're going to start the stadium and every time you hear the prime minister or anybody from the sports ministry speak about this stadium we always get a change of plans hmm. who is the minister of sports youth and there's something else there who is that person mr charles griffith honorable charles griffith honorable charles griffith so, you know, Honorable Charles Griffith, if you are listening tonight, um, I think it's very, very important that you hear what um, this head coach is saying about our young people and how difficult it is because we are looking to diversify our economy. I mean, Jamaica has gone all the way out there and, and gone into the sports and sports economy, sports economics, right? And, and yes. sports tourism and sports and, and, and all of that. Mr. Mr. Alvin Bab, can you can you um, talk about how not having a stadium would affect us with in terms of sports tourism and sports um, um, you know econo um, economy the sports economy how how would that affect us? When you have a stadium um, that is of a good quality, you have persons who will request to come into your country for training which promotes your tourism industry. Yeah. That stadium that we had was host to wrestling, cycling competition, night cricket, boxing, football. It wasn't just a stadium for track and field. It hosted a multiplicity of sports, which brought money into Barbados. So before a stadium, without that type of um, venue, then you see how much sports is affected. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, the Usain Bolt, this Usain person who said the Usain Bolt, yes. the University of the West Indies is not responsible for providing the stadium to Barbados. It is the government. The Usain Bolt Stadium is belongs to the belong to the university, so they should not be saddled with the responsibility of getting a trap ready for school sports. Mm. They don't have to. They're trying to save the minister's face, but they don't have to. And is that is that, uh, is that stadium um, adequate? Because I've spoken to, um, you know, persons who have gone to, to win, um, you know, lots of medals um, outside of Barbados. I wouldn't call their names right now. I've had young people on the show and they've told me that um, in, in their estimation, they're not coaches, but they are athletes, that that stadium is not adequate. What are your thoughts about that? In terms of space, this is what has ha happened. Now that the, the Usain Bolt is being con um, considered for a major event like BISA, coaches, the organizers will now have to look at a new schedule, limiting the amount of persons who come into the stadium. So now, as a coach, I am told, instead of having two athletes, 400, 200, and 400, I am only down to one. 
So now I have to de um, break a young person's, especially on the 17 or on the 20, who may be in school for the last year, wanted to perform in those events. I have now to make a decision on which one will participate in the event wow. because because there is no place big enough. Oh my! You say bowl is not um, made for large audiences or competitors. You're talking about 22 secondary schools. That is why you have seen the, they came up and uh, the BSAC committee came up with zones to limit the crowding. It is not safe either. Wow. Somebody's asking if um, we can host Car Festa next year? They, they meant Carifta Games? Um, it was, it was so bad. No, the, the person believe they met Carifta. Yes. We miss, we were the uh, Barbadian was the brainchild of the Carifta Games. Yes. The 50th anniversary came and went. And we should have been the host of those 50th anniversary games because it was so significant. We couldn't do it because we had no stadium. But we, but we just put up iron, Mr. Franklin. We just put up some iron and, and, and um, some concrete in the middle of town and call it art for $3 million. And our children mm -hmm. are not able to be able to express themselves on the track you know we can't we not we're not able to develop our athletes you hear what he said he has to decide which one to train because the place not big enough to train oh my goodness mr franklin what are your thoughts you know the, the first thing i would like to say to mr bob is that his opening remarks when he says that the government if you say something about the government they um, always attack you i'm not i'm i'm paraphrasing what he said you know mm -hmm. and he says it has to stop he wants the government to stop it I don't agree with you there. I think mm -hmm. the government should go. And that's, and that's how you would stop it. Because they have they have not shown any sort of leadership in this country. And the only leadership that they have shown so far is trying to change our youngsters into LGBT people. That's the only thing that they are doing in the passing legislation to, to achieve that. But when you, when you want to get help for young people who can because right now, you see the kind of money sportsmen make in the outside world. We, we ain't going to make that kind of money in Barbados if you don't got the facilities to train our people. And the one or two who will get a scholarship and go overseas, he might not even be the best candidate, but he might got the best strings. So you, you need to provide for these people rather than provide a cop housing for certain people that, and, and then you'll call it grants to um organization and stuff is it says money for for these people and the government the priorities are wrong they are not doing what this this, this, this what we expect them to do you know mm. everything is falling apart you know i let me finish i can talk about some other things that are falling apart but right now i want me it's, it's a bad thing to to yeah. just let you know that we feel for you i i know i know you're a good coach i know the kind of work you've been doing and it must be frustrating when you can do so much, but you can't do it because you, you, you're you making bricks without straw. You ain't getting the straw to make your bricks with, you know. Um, I, that, as a reference, that I read someplace one time to match here, um, this brick thing without straw. So I thought I'd use it. But, um, <laughs> yes, casual. <laughs> um, Marcia, you know? I want to put a plug for all the other coaches who have been, who had to wiggle through COVID, they had to find creative ways of keeping the interests of our uh, children. They practice at the beach. They trained in botanical gardens in some rocky conditions. Wherever they could have taken the children to maintain that interest, they did. And yes, they're making bricks without, without straw. Because today we are going to have some... Over the weekend, we are hoping with all the conditions, still have some character qualifiers. And it speaks to the resilience and the knowledge of our coaches in Barbados to suffer through this, but still continue to work voluntarily because a lot of them are teachers. This is what they do after their job, their time job, to make sure our youth in Barbados are occupied. Because if a parent knows that Jane and Mary and Bob is at a training ground, they're not on the block. 
they know exactly where they are and is this government must provide the stadium in the shortest time possible yes but you, so you realize Marcy, what's happening here mm -hmm. the government is providing venues for people to jump up yeah to um sheer decadence i quite see the people they're jumping up and walking up and doing all kind of madness and, uh, and like simulating sex on your feet and things that really matter mm -hmm. because these these are you see you might have 200 children involved in sports but you got a few thousand people out there walking up and jumping up and things so they are going to cater no matter which one is more important which is more uplifting they are they are looking toward the next election they're going to give people a lot of jump up and ralph spoke about it i i, I did hear him and he was speaking about these these i think it was on this show where he spoke about this type yeah. of thing where where people are providing these kind of venues you know like but that little guy is you know they want having a um, crop over fats and all kind of stuff out there no you know that's not a botanical garden you know you know yeah. but you know but they got they got they, and they got a few um river tamarind trees um a few woman town trees and a couple of things and you call it they got the botanical garden and they're trying to get home from they work late at night I, 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 i'm a bank holiday even they work in late make it i get home i can't get home because come to water and not knowing that they're going to be blocked up because that's all they're interested in jump up jump up jump up jump up nothing cultural nothing uplifting they, they don't they don't they don't, they don't have a, a thing where some classical music i remember when it was at school we had a teacher would take us into the library and turn on classical music that used to bore the hell of us but then you know i, I got an appreciation for it after yeah you know you know. but you're not but, training but, those minds yeah but somebody saying here how can mr bob um i'm gonna ask you to make your your final comments here but somebody is saying how can we train on grass and then go to regionals to run on track i mean i i'm telling you it, it i i can't understand why we why we we're treating our young people this way and it's not for lack of money because we're seeing how they're using money right now they have thirty thousand thirty million dollars that's going to be spent you know in a in a in a month right and so so it's not that we don't have money but it's about you know so mr mr bob um you know thanks for coming on um, is there Thank anything you. you want to say to the audience, a message you want to get to the Honorable Charles Griffith um, through the show? What, what do you want to say finally before you go, sir? I just want the um, the Barbadian public to be patient with um, the athletes. We have had the, the last five years has been very um, challenging. Um, we know we want to see medals, but we have not been given the condition to produce those medals. And those persons who are selected for Carifta, we want to give them to support. Um, show them that you understand their situation and appreciate their every performance. And when we and when we, there are meets, we need more people to come and support. And right now, it looks like St. George has turned into the mini stadium on grass for Barbadians. And we're asking who can come, just come in your numbers and support them in their efforts because uh, we are doing this in hope that, that in the shortest time possible that the ministry and the government will say to Barbadians that we are going to get a stadium by such and such a date. It will start by such and such a date. It will be completed by this date so so that they will that we will understand if you're saying something to us and it is and you say you say the truth right up front and tell us, look, this is the situation then we can't understand but every time you ask a question you get something different and then we ask the wrong questions and ask of them to give um to speak the truth they get they get annoyed with you yeah wow you know thank you mr bob i can i can feel the pain thank and you. hurt in your, in your heart um i miss thank you so much for coming on and we're going to keep in touch with you to know what's happening with those um, young people thank you so much sir have a good night yes sir um, you know, um, but I see Miss Miss McLean is there um, coming in, and she's talking about um, tourism tonight. And um, I have to find a way to also talk about sports tourism as well, because if we're talking about tourism, I think we need to look at it in in the widest sense. If we are very very serious uh, about it, but anything with the youth, Mr. Franklin, it just annoys me because when we don't make them priority and then we are going to say that they're doing all this kind of truancy and they're 
being, you know, um, they, 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 are, they are smoking weed and they're shooting up and they're doing all kinds of things. But we don't have any programs for them. We don't have anything for them, you know. It, 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 it's something else. But well, Miss McLean, good night. Hi, how are you? I am doing great. And you? I am doing fine, thanks. Um, hearing some good things about the show. I was just I was just hanging out with some friends and one young man, um, his voice is perhaps the exception. So maybe maybe where I left he is listening and I would say hello to him. Um, I I think the I think a lot of what we discuss on the pro the program maybe rubs him you know they say the truth sometimes hurts so yeah i guess some of the issues we raise it but that that doesn't stop him from being one of my friends <laughs> <laughs> you know but um i i, I really i <laughs> what i what i would say um and it's interesting because when when i whenever i leave home most of the times you know if i am on the road I, um, if i'm not in my car going from one place to the next i'm going let's say in the supermarket and i heard you just now speak about the elderly lady 80 something years old this program for a lot of people is indeed educational um yes. you know and 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 contrary to what this 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 gentleman was trying to say i tell him it is not partisan i draw a distinction between the discussion of political issues um, but I think sometimes people are so so firm in their support that they sometimes are not willing to 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 be to step back and and be be objective and take things for for what they're intended to you know hi easy D. I, I I I don't come here I mean I I do not hide the fact that I am a member of a political party I am a member of a former cabinet um and so on but when i speak here I, I speak of issues that anything i say i can substantiate the position that i take but as you said we we you know we we, we have been able to dissect issues and in fact one of one of the comments i heard today is that um a number of issues that government has had to revisit mm -hmm. would have been occasioned by an analysis of those issues here and oftentimes when you speak forget caswell myself but you when you started this show you were responding to the cause of people to talk about particular issues yeah you know and in that sense and i i i i read the time wrong you said 20 and i thought at 30 because you see when you get accustomed to yeah. certain things you eight o'clock eight thirty so my apologies but I, I i did want to talk a bit about tourism i'm not gonna specifically look in the estimates at the amount and i i i, no, I, no, I know no, before you that, do that maxine before mm -hmm. you do that you know that people say that this show is political and all kind of stuff and, and I, if it is and it's not partisan it, it's not party it's not partisan that's the point because look i sit here and when i thought that the damn did something then like i trashed them you know, I, I, and nobody, I didn't, I didn't think, you know, that they can say I'm a them now, or I was a B then, and money curse in the B, I'm a D. It's, it's, it's absolute nonsense. You know, people do not want to accept the truth, especially when it, 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 it steps on their toe. You know, but you got to be honest with yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I, can I, can I, um, Miss McLean, I'm going to give you back your time, but I, I, you said something that made me forgot something that I have to announce. Because you said that there are many issues that were raised on this show that the government, um, having to do with policies and, um, that the government, um, you know, decides to put forward. And they've had to walk them back. There are so many, Mr. Franklin, and one of them that was brought to our attention on the show was the medical form for disabled. Yes, uh -huh. Sonia Brown you talked about that. it. You saw that. You remember we had a, a night, a show that we looked at this, and I want to. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna mention somebody's name here, um, and I hope I don't put her in trouble. But Dr. Sonia Brown, Dr. Sonia Brown, okay, she is that MP. She's a BLP MP, but she raised um, this issue in Parliament. Did you guys hear her? Yes, I, I did. I, 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 I read she about apologized. it. She apologized. I listened because I I have been following. I mean, I followed the first day from the beginning to the end, um, and and I listened to most of yesterday, and I listened to a lot of today. Um, 
and she did say that it might some people might have been uncomfortable that was not her word but that's a paraphrase of about her raising it again which meant that she had raised it in some forum uh, perhaps among colleagues or whatever and she as a medical doctor would have been challenged this is again my interpretation of how she put it when being asked to complete the form the retort um from from the minister because this came under the discussion of i think it would have been with minister humphrey yes um the 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 people's empowerment and 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 um and the ministry of people's empowerment and elderly Elder affairs, affairs. Yeah. um he would have and his response was that he thought it had been discontinued i remember when you raised it here and you did so very cautiously and, and we discussed it in fact and the point that the minister made in response to her question or you know her concern she expressed concern etc was that we have to be very careful about how we adopt things from other cultures and other jurisdictions mm -hmm. and in fact part of what you have to do is to to adapt them to the to our particular circumstances and i think i think that was that was one of the one of the the issue that came up because i remember when you shared the form i could not for the life of me i asked a couple of doctors about it and mm -hmm. i couldn't for the life of me understand why but you see this is where when no i i can't blame a policy maker because the question that i would have to put on the table in relation to that is who introduced the form? And I think somebody suggested in the discussion in Parliament that it was an international agency. You know. Oh, you see. Um, and 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 you know, the name, I, if I if I am wrong, I apologize. But my recollection there was well, there was some reference to the IDB. No, it may be, and we can go back and listen to that to that debate. That would have been on day one. It would have been in the afternoon. Um, and you will hear exactly the exchanges between minutes in the member of parliament brown and minister humphrey and so on on this matter but you see it could have if nobody raised it marcia um if I, I you were talking and i i went on but you know if nobody raised it it probably would still be in use and to that's what end and for what purpose yeah and again that's another group that we would be um you know that they don't have a voice you know mr franklin they don't have a voice but they can they can raise those issues and if they raise it it's a small group so now they need they need us they need more more of us to pick up those issues and to raise them and that's what we did on this show and i was happy to see that dr sonia brown um she's a blp so don't tell us that we don't we're not celebrating and we don't talk when they do anything good what we're saying is this if you're all in there look out for the people of this country and when you do not look out for the people of this country we are going to come after you it's simple it's very simple you look out for the people and we are going to thank you for looking out for the people so we thank dr sonia brown but i'm taking up your time miss miss mclean yeah um yeah well that is important and and i think it's it's it is part of why we do what we do now as i said i wanted to say something about tourism because at the end of the day well that was the issue and they have, i'm just searching for a comment from somebody as i speak um the, the that's the that's the 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 the, the, the head the, the ministry that was um being reviewed today and i don't think that the um the leader of the opposition got a chance to speak um you know he hasn't spoken yet because you know the form but he did speak sorry in terms of introductory comments but he didn't pose question um and so it i believe on monday he may be one of the first people to speak but as i listen to the various discussions you're reminded of course that tourism is so critical to our our um economy but it also and and because it is so critical i think that um, as a mature destination, we really have to do a lot of introspection. And, and, and when, so when we start to look at the numbers and we, we hear from our professionals, you know, in the ministries and the various agencies that provide, you know, support to, to, to the private sector and so on. I think as somebody who has traveled fairly widely, I am concerned that we have perhaps reached a point where as a mature destination we are 
plateauing or we have plateaued in many respects mm -hmm. and others who looked to Barbados um, as a you know as an exemplar who who looked to copy some of the things that we did in the past are now perhaps surpassing us and whether and I, I I've identified a couple of things that we, we have to touch on and I, I think one of the words I think I heard um, probably coming from from the leader of opposition today when he talked about attitudes I you know I, I think when we think of tourism it's it's a, a people's business you know I I remember the slogan we had for some years um, tourism is our business let's play our part meaning that everybody has a stake in the success of oh, the slogan. I thought you were talking about a little big slogan. Eh? <laughs> oh, no, that was that was that, that was that that one has not resonated. Um, I don't know. It has not resonated, and I'm not sure that it has been replaced. But you know, mm -hmm. that's 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 something to be uh, determined. About a thirteen mark a medium, it didn't replace. To come up with come up with slogan. Not, no, they had a thirteen mark a medium to, to find the thing. Um, to find a replacement for that one? Yeah, but they had a big committee to, to come up with it, to something for that. Then get, then, then find out yet? With a little slogan? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know as well. Um, no, but I think I think they're, they're, that in itself speaks to perhaps another area because, as I was saying, the attitudes is something we have to think about. And, uh, and, and for me, and this is reflecting on comments that you hear, and, and, and in my case, I've been hearing them, uh, from a number of people, that Barbados is is an expensive jurisdiction, tourist you know tourist destination, and therefore people are very concerned that at the end of the day, that they get value for their money, and it is something that has to be top of mind for us, whether we are owners of attractions or hotels or any other support kind of services, whether we are employees, or whether you know we are John citizens. I mean and and I think a lot of a lot of things are of concern. I, I mean, I heard and I agree that there's a um, there's a, a need to really pay attention to our our attractions and to find some new new opportunities to engage engage our, our visitors and have them spend money. Um, so you know, there's there's a discussion of the of the the shifting demographics of our visitors, and I, I want to say something in terms of that. Um, and and somebody's correct. If if our stadium, you mentioned sports tourism, and that that is, I remember some years ago, you would have some um, sports teams, professional teams coming here in the winter to train. I remember when the um, the the um, the the aquatic center was 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 it in the early days of the aquatic center. Some some athletic teams coming to Barbados. No. I want to signal in on something because I talked about attitudes and I, I and this has been a bugbear for me for many years. I have had relatives come to Barbados and this has to do with the perception of who is a tourist. And for a lot of people, this notion of a tourist is a Caucasian or a non-black person. Uh -huh. um, and it is something we have to deal with. We talk about we talk about Africa. Yesterday, we had the pleasure, Caswell and Marcy, of of talking to some wonderful little children um, at Eagle Hall Primary School, and there were there it was their African Awareness Day, and we were talking about Malawi. Um, but when I when I think of Africa and all that we have been hearing, not now. I mean, it is accelerating now because there's a uh, a, a, a by directional interest that is interest from Africa, interest from the Caribbean, Latin America, in the whole African diaspora. But too often we get complaints, not only of Africans but of Black Americans, Afri Afro African Americans coming to Barbados. And and recently I was I was reading um, and for you know we talk about demographics. There's a there's a growing number of younger folks, for the most part, who have been using social media and they are developing what they call content. So in other words, we don't have to wait for large movie productions or large documentaries by our um, media stations. People are traveling around the world 
um, across Africa. Recently, we had a young man that I've been following who started out as a, an engineering student in China doing doing blogs and vlogs. And he came to the Caribbean, having, having traveled to probably about more than half of the countries and the African continent. He started out a couple months ago. Well, he said that for the last six years, he wanted to visit Jamaica. Um, but he started out in Brazil, made his way to Suriname, Guyana, um, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados. And now he spent about a month in Jamaica and so on. But he has been complaining about some of the treatments that he or his, his team, because, you know, you're filming and so on, you're working with a team, the kind of reception, the kind of difficulties that they encountered. And he's not the only one. There's one Nigerian, and just to show you how lucrative this this um this business is for them who who earn money through YouTube, um, you know, showing their videos. This young man has over a million followers, um, and has done interviews from presidents to young entrepreneurs to you know all kinds of um, material that is put together. Um, and in fact, he serves to do a lot of promotion for those areas that he visits and those companies and individuals. But the, and as I as I was saying, there's another Nigerian. He's Ghanaian, but there's a Nigerian who just indicated that he spent one hundred and fifty thousand U.S. dollars mm. to purchase. To you know, you have passports. Uh, he he has he now has a Saint Kitts and Nevis passport. Yeah. Because in and that is Tayo. Um, I'm trying to remember his last name, but this is a Nigerian. Um, and if you watch his shows, he hit part a lot of what I'm he does. I'll try to get often. the name for you. Keep going. I'll try to get the name for you. Tayo. Yeah, Tayo. So he he was having some challenges because his his um content is is global. He travels around the world. And he realized that to use his Nigerian passport was more difficult than using um, a, a, a passport from St. Kitts and Nevis, which allows him to, to have the visa free access and perhaps easier travel, even if he has to get a visa. Um, you know, uh, Wadamaya, Wadamaya is, the, is the young man that was here. He was in Queen's Park Christmas morning. Um, and elsewhere, he was in Can. He came back to. He went back to Trinidad for carnival. He went to. He went to a maroon village, Marcia, in Suriname. He met with the vice president of Suriname, who himself is a maroon. I'm speaking yeah. of all of this because there is a major mar set of. I would call them a set of markets because target markets that we have not necessarily identified properly. Or where they exist, we have we have minimized the importance of them, mm -hmm. um, and I, I really want to say because I have I have had experiences. You and I had an experience at a certain hotel in Barbados when we went to meet. I think it was I went with you to meet. Um, he was coming from South Africa. It was South Africa. Um, there was there was a there was a gentleman who came in. He was into film. And we went yes. to meet him and he had just come in and, and I, I basically had to apologize. We were sitting there forever um, listening to him talk about, I mean, he, he was obviously jet lagged because he'd come, you know, the, the travel and so on. But the service was less than good and I had to make a complaint about it. That same hotel, I had to register a complaint because I have a cousin who lives in Germany. His, his wife is white. And if she is dealing with the staff and so on, it's fine. But anytime he dealt with it, and I was, and I discovered this because I was saying, well, you need to bring some of your your friends to Barbados. You know, the guys who were in the army because he was in the British army and then moved to Germany. And he said, no, I don't think so, because. And then he related to me, and I, I actually went contacting management at the hotel. So I am talking about, as I said, we can sit and analyze, you know, what's happening, but there is a significant market and I'm focusing on Africa. Now, the first thing people will say to me is perhaps, uh, but we don't have airlift. But before we even get to visit Africans on the continent, if mm. you do some research on the African diaspora, Africans in North America, in the US, for, for example, you have, I'll just give you an example. You have in Washington, D.C., an organization, it's a, 
it's a, a, a young professionals. It's called Young African Professionals. And in D.C. alone, that is a network of 10,000 persons. Now, you imagine if you were able to have that group yeah. come to Barbados. Hmm? So, as, as I said, it's a, yeah, what Young African Professionals is, as I said, it's a, it's a group in D.C. and you probably have these. And in fact, for every professional organization, whether it's professional, firemen, you know, firemen, nurses, doctors, you have you know, teachers, you name it, engineers, they have these organizations who have conferences and, and reunions. And then you have the whole sorority and fraternity at the universities across the U.S. and, and in, in terms of historically black colleges. So one of the critical things I'm, I'm saying, Marcy, is that we complain, um, well, not we complain, we realize that we, 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 we are... We are finding ourselves facing increasing competition within the region and, and beyond, but we have not had a studied campaign to attract persons who have who have an interest. So I'm I'm suggesting that you you know for example, um, and 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 in terms of of Africans Nigerians for example, research has shown and it is documented are the most highly qualified immigrant group in America. And with qualifications come earning. So when you look, and then for example, if you look at black Americans, for example, their spending patterns. So I, I am thinking that, so that's, that's the whole question of visitors. Another critical point I want to make, and you will signal to me when, when, when I, when I have to stop talking is that we, we, you know, as I reflected on a piece of legislation that was passed the Ma other day. Maxine, before you go, you go on to that site, you said something that I have to uh, correct you on. You know, you, you were saying that they don't, uh, like these 10,000 people from Washington, D.C. and stuff, that and they're not getting these, these groups, right? We had one here the other day, man. The LGBT group at Sam Lawrence Castle, every room did book. <laughs> You hear about that? I, I heard about it, but that that was <laughs> so so that wasn't. But that, that is that is what we are interested in in this so country right now. Oh, okay, I got you. That is what we are interested. We are not interested in up, anything uplifting. We young, young African professionals. The, the, not young African professionals or not, not, um young millionaires group unless you're a gear group. What they are interested in is what they are putting their focus on, what the group that they are trying to attract. So I just wanted to. Let you um to, to to let you know that they're actually, they're actually doing what you're asking, but not wholesome. Okay, not not going after the, the target groups that I, I I am suggesting that they can go after, and and that is that is I mean that is unfortunate that for me when I look at this group of people, um, you know, and and somebody mentioned African tigress. Yes, she she's done some interesting write up. She's also spoken of her experiences. Um, but but it really is, and, and I was saying, no, beyond the, 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 the customer, the visitor that we want to target, I was looking, Caswell, at, at, at least I was reflecting when we talked about the labor clauses, um, legislation, and concession. Bill. One of the things for years I've had this kind of conversation is that where those concessions are given, no, this is about standards. There's also, there needs to be some reciprocity. In other words, we as taxpayers, taxpayers um, lose revenue when concessions are given. Let me put it with government loses revenue, which should, which should serve to benefit taxpayers. In the absence of that revenue, or because of that, um, greater consideration should be given by some of these um, industries in tourism, you know, about what I will call intersectoral linkages. Um, and, and we've talked about agriculture over the years. And yes, it is, it is what I call a two-way problem in the sense that if, if, if our farmers and agro-processors and so on are not consistent, there can be challenges. But the truth is, I don't think that there's enough effort. I mean, again, talking about my travels, I traveled almost every country in South and Central America. Well, significant numbers. In the Caribbean, the same thing. 
you go to breakfast in a hotel in Jamaica, in Grenada, in um, Panama, unless that's what less you go to Mexico, you go to Guatemala. I'm just naming some of the places I've gone. And you go to breakfast and you see a lot of local fruit. Fruit. You don't see it here. And it isn't for the, I mean, if, if there's a demand for something, you will get it. I mean, take something like mangoes. I have noticed on any given year now that um, in the last few years, of course, that we seem to have had bumper mango seasons. But I cannot remember, and if I am wrong, Marcia Caswell, if you have had a different experience, but I cannot remember going to breakfast with any of my friends who would have traveled to Barbados or, or somebody. We went there to, you know, somebody's birthday or whatever. To see my fresh mango, I will see, I will see melons and, you know, um, watermelon and, and, and the other, the other uh, cantaloupe and maybe apples or whatever. So I'm just thinking that we can, you know, as we get in the discussion of this um, thing, we, my question, really, there are two big questions to me. To what extent are we seeing the benefit of what I call intersectoral linkages where there is greater utilization of the, the products and services of other local or indigenous businesses, our work, um, and I look behind me right here. So this is a piece of, of art that I picked up on the street of Kenya. It is painted on crocus bag, what we call crocus bag. And I brought it home and a local company did the framing for me. You know, mm -hmm. um, the, it was, it was very cheap, but it is, it is something, you know, but it was, it, it, it reminds me of my first visit to Kenya. You know, and, and so I think the things that we need to be able to do that to make to make opportunities greater because you know it we, tourism is important, but it can it can be more beneficial if there are there are those linkages. The second thing is that as we as we look at the aging population of some of our traditional markets, I say Europe and so on. Well, of course, if you look at the UK, the population demographics of the United Kingdom is changing. Those, uh -huh. those demographics are changing, rather. If you look at, I mean, I tell people that in another 15, 20 years, the UK will be a country of brown people. Um, you know, a lot of people of mixed race, whether it's Indian and white, Indian and black, black and white and so on. Um, Similarly, you're seeing some of that in the U.S., but I think to a lower, a, a, a slower pace. But we have to think of who we are. And then one of the things, I, and I will stop there, I believe, um, so get a response on you, Caswell, is that we've been talking recently, and I'm coming now to look at what has been happening in our, you know, tourism sector, because I've, I've stayed away from commenting specifically on some programs and so on. But something that has bothered me and it drove me to do some research is um, recent activities in relation to, to what I would call the Middle Eastern or Arab market. Um, and I remember that there was a big write-up and, and commentary about um, a, 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 a mission to, I think it may, might have been something in Dubai and or Dubai, yeah. Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Now, if, if, you, if you take the time to Google there are a couple of things that jump out at me. One is that you, I would call that the, it, it's really about the ultra wealthy market because you have high net worth. I mean, know a lot of people come to villas and so on, but you also have what I call the, this ultra wealthy market for a lot of people in the Middle East, whether it's is, um, UAE, United Arab Emirates, du, um, you know, we hear about Dubai within that context, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, and so on. Because if you visit those countries, you would recognize that for a large percentage of the population, they have significant wealth. And so what they are looking for in terms of accommodations and so on, we do not currently provide. And so my question is, are, you know, are we looking perhaps to encourage the same people to invest in the kind of hotel? Then, for example, in some cases, they will tell you because of their religion. Men stay on one floor in the hotel and women stay on another. You know, can we can we accommodate 
a, a, a delegation, you know, a plain load of those persons. So I think for me, Marcia, as we as we um, talk about tourism, and, and I look forward to hearing some more, I listen to some of, of the discussion, um, and, and, it, and I look forward to hearing what the lead of the opposition raises, because, you know, I... I, we know how the, the, the political inter, interaction goes, um, and, and I, 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 I use I, I, re, I recall his, his term to describe um, the situation where ministers are quizzing. They only talked about an orgy of self congratulation. It seems I like to I like I am a student of English literature in my my days in fifth and sixth form. So those what you call terms of phrase really are those things um, I find I like to hear them, but. I, I am all in all, Marcia. Tourism will continue to be a significant plank. Um, if I if I were to look at some specifics, I have very serious concerns about what is happening in the cruise sector. I've heard this afternoon during the day when they had the debate about some numbers in the summer. But my question is, what is happening in the in the next year in terms of the ships coming um, as a farmer? chairperson and, and director of the Bridgetown Cruise Terminal from its inception on to 2008. That company has now been, um, it's in the process of being wrapped up. And while I have right. it, I, I would love the, the, the chairman to, to update me. That's a personal request because I'm a shareholder. Um, so that is not politics. That's, that's my finances that I would yeah. ask that. But, you know, I'm wondering what's happening in cruise. Um, and yachting is another area, but I think I've said a lot. So, yes, African tourism so has much. to coincide with the re education of Africa, and yeah. that is true. And yeah. as was he said, in spite of all dress up, it is it is something we have to work on. Marcia yeah. has been trying with her movie. Go ahead, Marcia. Yeah, on that note, about um, I want to say thank you, Calvin. I think this is a very, very important point that he's making because I was speaking with persons, Mr. Franklin, in Jamaica last night and they were telling me that there is such a buzz in jamaica right now about africa and african tourism and that that they are getting just an influx of africans going um into jamaica and um and and i think what calvin mckenzie is saying is the key to it that it has to coincide with a re-education of africa right africa to us and how we treat people and because, it, you know, uh, in terms of policy, if we see Africans not at the same level as, as, as we are, or of people that we should, you know, invite into our country, then we're not going to be creating policy, tourism po um, policy at that level then, and, and, and strategy, right? And, and making them, we won't make them a target group because we don't see any value in them coming um, to to Barbados, and and I think that that is that is that is so important. Um, Adrian Hines is also, um, and I'm reading your comments, guys. Send in the comments. Adrian Bino, I'm sorry, is asking where are our local fruits? The tamarinds, the gooseberry, the golden apples, the ripe almonds, and all of these things. That when people come here, are they experiencing um, all of that? Um, Mr. Franklin, um, what, what are your thoughts about um, the, the uh, uh, tourism? Because that's what they, they're discussing right now in the estimates. Uh, yeah, yes, Maxine made a very good point when she was talking about the, the linkages. And I, I remember a friend of mine, he bought a, a sports group to Barbados, bought a building. And he bought the, the people down to his house. I live next door, I, so I'll be... Um, I went upstairs to help out and meet some of the people and talk all over my face. And one man said to me, because I, I want to make some good fish cakes, you know, and when they try these fish cakes, the guy said to me, you know, but well, we can get this for breakfast at the hotel because he said, if I, I didn't come to Barbados to get a continental breakfast, I could have stayed in New York. You know, that was his take on it. And we keep on talking and he, he, he said um, that we were actually taking him to Oysters and he was real pissed off because they took too long to feed him. He said, but when he got the snapper, that Fred snapper and, and whatever else they had on the plate, he said it was the best snapper he ever had. He would have, if he knew it was so good, he would have waited another hour, you know. But we give the people the food that they're custom eating. 
back home. They don't want them. You know, when you when you go to the States and you um or in Canada, because that's my experience, they can almost kill me with fried fish. They the fish just like they cut it off the fish, put it in the breadcrumbs and fry it, deep fry it. And then you gotta add your season onto it. I mind you, I didn't know that that was the case. And I saw these golden brown steaks of fish, and I said, Good, at least I got something that I can eat today. And I stuck my knife in it and I did like that. I put it in my mouth and I spit it, you know. <laughs> but he's saying, This is the best fish he ever had. And and he, he and so, but he only got it in all his sense. He didn't get anywhere near his hotel, right? And they, and they give you the things that. The people are accustomed to at home. Because he don't come shopping. He don't come to to Barbados to get American food. You know, my thing. I when I travel myself, I eat this stuff. I went to France. I had the escargot. I didn't get that, that, that kind of stuff. You, you, you know, I I enjoy that. We had some other guys who said I ain't touching that. I I had alligator in you in in New Orleans. You know, because you know I, I give a little joke about that one. We, the whole group of us we were attending Cunham, um School, so the people from all over the states with us, and they took us to dinner uh, one uh, night. You may want to turn off your um, your camera for a minute and see what happens. Okay, you're back. You know, you know. So no, when <laughs> so I I go out to this restaurant, the people bought some alligator bits for us to try, and nobody wants to touch them, you know, because they're not from New Orleans, and I'm not from New Orleans, and nobody's touched. So I, I took a piece and I tied, and I said, "Hmm, good." And now I'm the only well, oh, and they're saying, me. they're saying, oh, yeah. what, what is like, man? What is like? And I said, <laughs> it tastes like cat. She <laughs> said, cat? What do you mean cat? I said, you don't know cat? Puss, puss. She said, oh my God, no. <laughs> I had all for myself. Nobody else would touch it. <laughs> I had so much that I get it that night. That I can, that was my main course. Yeah, you're disappointed. <laughs> But you know, so, somebody's saying here that um, Ramim is saying here, agreeing with you, Mr. Franklin. I keep saying we have low self esteem. I agree, we need to offer Bajan meals as default. I agree with that. You know, I, I, that, that, yeah, they, they're here in Barbados, after all. Give them soup with dumplings and that kind of thing, you know. People want that. The, 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 it's, it's new to them. We went, we, 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 I went training when I went to the Labor College in the States. The black people from Barbados and um, Trinidad and Jamaica, we, we, we went down to this place and we cooked some food for these people. And you know when they finished, they asked me um, at the end of the meals and stuff, when they had eaten and all kind of stuff, because we gave them peas and rice and stew and all kind of stuff. You know, you know they had the gall to ask. If you come back next week. <laughs> I said, okay. These people want me to cook for them. I said, no way, you know, because they, they, they don't have rice and peas, you know, they have rice and peas but not rice and peas and 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 it was they, they thought it was strange and mind you beef somehow one of the fellas find salt beef and they put that in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the pot too you know and this thing was a was a was a thrill to those people but we bring them here and give them the food that they want so we need to give them what we are produce mm -hmm. and that and that would stop our food import bill from being so high because we import a lot of stuff into Barbados for the hotels. When the mm -hmm. hotels should be buying locally, they don't. Yeah. You know, so Maxine was quite right. And and, and um, our agriculture will not take off if we um, don't feed the tourists that come here with our local produce or if we buy stuff from Suriname and Black Belly Sheep from Guyana. You know, but I couldn't help that, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know somebody's saying that we we um we um I'm saying that Chesterfield says I was saying that all along they are not giving the tourists the real indigenous Bajan food or dishes which is what they want um they want free culture. I remember Mr. Franklin, we went to um we went to Tobago just the other day, and what was interesting about it is. We, where we stayed was in the community. You know, we were we had our um, it was a, we had a lovely um, place there, but um, it was uh, among the people. So when the fishermen came in, we were able to we walked down by the sea and we saw that they they had these huge you know the huge fish and all of that, and we we bought some from them. 
we bought some from them we were there with them all the people there with their bags waiting we didn't have a bag somebody from the, the community said but you buy but you don't have a bag and gave us a bag and we chatted with them all there and and so on and so forth so i think that we have to revisit some of these things i mean at least i live in st philip here and sometimes you do see the um the tourists coming down from um sam lord's castle but the difference with tobago is the interaction with the community you know so we have to find a way that they experience barbados so they're not just locked away in the hotel so we will see them in st philip here if they're running on the street or so but in Tobago, there is an interaction with the white, not just black tourists like myself, but white tourists as well. There's an interaction with them and the people that happen because of, I guess, probably because where the hotel is. I'm not sure, but it, it just happens, you know. Have we lost Maxine? Yes, she's she's um um coming in. You know, um, let me just read some of these um comments um here. Um, just reading some of the comments. Okay, somebody says that if we give them what we produce, folks will be eating cement. Is <laughs> 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 Yeah, you know, this old house is a restaurant. There's a restaurant, this mm. old house in St. Philip. Here yes, we go again. They're, 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 they're really, they're really a hard time tonight, Marcia. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. <laughs> I say you're getting a hard time tonight, but at least on, on my end, it's dropping in and out. I don't know. No, you're you're experiencing there. Yeah, I, I realize that. I realize that this old house. We are resilient. Um, you know, we're talking about our ancestors, so we can't give up. We're, we're resilient can't people. Can't give up. Can't give up. Right. This old house, they're saying, is on the right track, right? Um, this is our restaurant, Mr. Franklin, um, here in Saint, um, here close to Sam Lord's, and <laughs> they have a lot. That's of where authentic, we went. Yeah. Yes, a lot of authentic Barbadian um, food, um, and very good too. Very good settings. The yes, surroundings yeah. is nice. They have a lot of um, you know old emblems. You would call memorabilia. them memorabilia. Yeah memorabilia you know you will see an old mm -hmm. iron and they have coconuts and you know things um, like that but i think the question is though as we're talking about um tourism and we're going to um segue um into another go into another segment but do i think when you talk to the average barbadian though they, they're wondering should we be continuing along this line of, of, of seeing tourism as our main um you know as, 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 as a main the main um economic um support i'm i'm lots of words yeah i'm looking for the right phrase I'm, I'm looking for um where where it is this is our main state you know mr franklin is this is this is this where we should be heading at this is 2024. no sorry i was just getting a message yeah. because my, my, my people were trying to Asked me things to say on the program. They wanted to get the issues, things that I ain't talking about them. So, but uh, oh, we'll get there. All right, but after yeah. this, let's do this and then yeah, yeah. Yes, go ahead. I can get him. I tell him, but they, 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 they want the issues out. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Oh, Lordy. Some, yeah. Another group asked me, they want to come on the show, um, kidney, um, I think it's the kidney association or something like that. They wanted to come on and talk to. I got a message from them as well, you know. So everybody, the Marshall Week, Marshall Week show yes. is growing. Everybody, this is the place to be. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but um, before we we, I know you, Mr. Franklin, you had a couple of things you wanted to deal with tonight. But I want us to look at um, you know, what other the other sectors and should we be should we be focusing um solely on you know, um, on tourism as our main economic driver? Definitely not. The reason being, we had COVID. And in three days, all the tourists are gone. All the hotels closed down and they treated the staff very badly. The government conspired with the hotels to make sure that the staff don't get any money. And people are still, 
to this day not been paid the severance that was entitled to them what we need we need to have to be, to be able to diversify yes we must we should have tourism but we must have something else to fall back on because yeah. when we didn't when when the tourists and we can have another pandemic they're planning one so yeah. if that happens next thing you know we're gonna go through that again mm -hmm. and we must not be caught flat-footed ever again but well well about ask the government because they, they they don't they don't um understand what they're doing I, they they promised these cruise ships you know those cruise ships they, they, all of the cruise ships will come back to bad business if you treat them good you know that kind of stuff they don't think and they put the cruise ships out there and mash it half our reef and then the, the cruise ships can come in no, but we so we they, they were trying to put oh they, they're trying to be like a smart a, a smart one you know to get to get up on the um, the uh, the other people, the other people don't look at Grenada. You you got market. Just trying to be nice and pretend that you're talking pretty all over the world. Don't get tourists here. Look at Grenada. And, oh, and by the way, there's a Belgian that's doing it for Grenada, isn't she? You know. Yeah. And we and, and instead we are getting people from overseas to come and not market our place, pay them good bucks. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, this is it is. Uh, somebody says. Um, Sorry, there was a comment here. Someone was saying, though, that in all fairness, some of the hotels have local executive chefs and their menus have local fare. Um, flair, I think that's what they want to say. Yes, there is. There, there. Some of that is going on. I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mr. Mr. Franklin, yes. I know you came mm -hmm. on. You came on the show with a lot of things on your mind. I'm not seeing Kimar. Just so that everybody knows that's right. So we were expecting Kimar at 9 10 and I'm not seeing him. I don't know if there's something um with his Wi-Fi, why I'm not seeing him on tonight. But we had expected him to join at 9 10 tonight and he's, he's I'm not seeing him at the moment. I'm just seeing one tick going on on his phone. But um Mr. Franklin, you had some some um you haven't had a chance yet to to share what you came on here to share so go ahead sir. um i came on there to support and i will share eventually <laughs> um the we're having some issues with workers issues yes and the way workers are being treated in barbados it is it is it is a, a, a scandal of national proportions what is going on with people in this country we have a lot of sick buildings mm -hmm. and the way the government treats the sick building is to find out that the buildings are sick, get um, reports from the professionals, and they don't tell the staff. Mm -hmm. So staff continue to get sick in the building, and they feel that it's a something wrong with them or something wrong. Till eventually they find out, but sometimes it might be too late because they understand one teacher at law school died as a result of the building up there, and. That's when the law school really, will get frightened. Teacher, you're saying that they, they're alleging that the teacher died? Well, that's that, been hidden. They didn't tell anybody, but the, the teachers believe that, that the teacher who died at the beginning of the term was the result of the conditions at the law school. And that's when they started to act up and, start, and stay at home because the law school was closed. End of it still is, and children were online because mm -hmm. the place had a lot of mold. And the mold don't appear overnight. Mm -hmm. These the conditions... Persist. And then they got somebody to come in and clean them, but the teacher, you know, teachers like chalk. So the teachers put chalk marks on some of the places that the people are supposed to clean and come back after they clean and found the same chalk marks. So that, that's another reason. So they get people to do the cleaning that didn't do a good enough job. I don't know who they are. Right? But the, the one that troubles me yesterday, I, I had, and, and, but people come into my office complaining that this building Boabab Towers. You know they um because I had told my my, my people in there do not go back in the building. Because the Boabab Towers, that's one of the national insurance buildings. And in, in twenty twenty three there were there were there, there was um some stench and thing going on in the building and the, the government commissioned a study and they had a report but the report was so devastating that they didn't share it with the staff. They allowed the staff to come back in and then tell them nothing. What it is only now. Huh? 
you're saying that the the government that you skip over that so fast i have to sorry i'm asking you because i want to i want you people to understand so you're saying right. that in 2023 it, april uh -huh. the government had its um what they do to check the building up for um the problems and air quality tests and whatever else they do and the results was was so devastating they didn't want the staff to know so they allowed the staff to continue to work without telling them anything it is only and, and i think marcia cattle she is she came in and she started to do some things that so i must appreciate that she she tried to help the situation I, i'm not going to um when they, when they do something that is good i will i will speak to it but it was a bit a little bit too late because she was there to try to solve the problem then right but the problem existed before she came long before she came and, 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 and I'll, I'll be fair to her she she was trying her best to see what how things can work but by that time i told my my staff my people don't go back in there uh -huh. because the the they, they had the um the report from the people what they did in one instance is to put flash band you know what flash band is you know that um sil that silver thing tape type thing that you put on top of roofs to block the holes yeah. they they seal the doors with flash band so that some that's that's a way that they try to fix the problem rather and than this, get this is a government this is a government building this is the building that national insurance owned Boabab towers right and wow. you know national insurance build these buildings when government want a building they get national insurance to build it for them rather than go and find financing and then they will rent it from national insurance right they so are, this is the building where, where kaipo is um part of no they, they, this is yeah in the bottom down there and warren bottom down there okay. but this is this is on the third and fourth floor that we're talking about so the okay. sewage gases were coming back into the building that was what was making people sick mm. now sewage gases contained whole set of problems you got methane you got um carbon dioxide carbon monoxide you you, you have ammonia the, the whole soup of um problems that you will you will get from breathing in these gases and they took it upon themselves to secrete that information from the staff and then when they did have the meeting yesterday when they were trying to to solve the problem now they were asking the staff no not you know that we let you know don't 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 let out the information we know the people they can, they can call me too and can i call the newspapers because you cannot have people working in these conditions and 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 senior civil servants you know, not even ministers now senior civil servants decided to hide this information you have a duty a permanent secretary is responsible for the health and safety of the people in this ministry that's in the public service act i am making it up so if a permanent secretary or somebody like that refuses to do their duty and a person gets sick that person must, must be liable and if the permanent secretary is liable then the government is liable because you have to give people um a safe place of work and a safe system of work that is in the common law and it then has been repeated now in the safety and health at work act so you cannot you, you can't be you, there's no excuse for having life threatening things happening in the building and you hope that the people will not die when they're at, home, at work and, and and don't inform them that this is the situation that is one today sanitation people called me and i had actually told them well but I had to, you have to give them permission or not if you a unit doesn't give them permission they are off the job without um consent they don't they, they, they could be deemed to be walking off the job but if it is supported by your union and for good cause then it is not it is industrial action supported by the union but they had they had they were drinking from these water tanks now for a while and somebody looked into the tank and found so many millipedes you can count 
Millipedes and something they call hog lice. I do not know exactly what hog lice look like. I don't know them. I am only repeat, uh, reporting on what I've been told. You know, they complained to management about it before and management did nothing. So only when they decided to take action, start working and call the press that they were out there and get them ball water and all kind of nonsense. The, the, the problem is that you, you cannot treat human beings like that. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have people drinking from tanks that know that has millipedes and i'm not talking about one or two little millipedes i'm talking about enough yeah and, and and you have people drinking that water god knows what illnesses they're going to end up with down the world because i don't think millipedes are um food quality stuff you know but and and you could and you would treat sanitation workers like that because they work with garbage but they're not garbage they're normal human beings like me and you that mm -hmm. need to be I, I really believe that the acting manager of sanitation, who is responsible for sanitation now, hates, but mind you, he should be home, but I know he's a retiree that I brought back. His head should roll. And I, do, I don't like calling for people's dismissal from anything, because I, I, I like saving people's jobs. But when you have a person who refused to respond, or respond adequately, to some person complaining, telling you that they, um, that they got me drinking military water, and you ain't doing nothing about it. You refuse to come and see for yourself. You refuse to send anybody to look. That is a problem. That, that speaks to how you look at the people who work under you. You, you treat them like animals. You know? And, um, but this, these are not the only things I was going to talk about. The other national insurance buildings, because national insurance has three buildings, all of which are... Um, hazardous to people's health there is the bobab towers then there's the warren tower two that they got problems with again and mm -hmm. also and then and then there's the building that they call the e humphrey walk up building just up called Marat by the traffic lights all what's of these buildings pardon what's wrong with the e uh, um the e humphrey walk up building building it's hot it's um it, you get smells too and um the staff the staff are actually complaining about the the quality in there some time ago they had to close it down and this it had to be closed for a year because again they brought in professionals who spread it was for bed bugs at first and they spread it with a chemical that almost killed everybody inside they had to run them out and it, and it couldn't be habit it couldn't be in it for another year <laughs> yeah. Um, Ramim 60, 70. I, I just said uh, that, but some funny, but then funny, but that's, that's, that's what really can happen, you know. They put less sickness benefits and 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 that kind of thing. Unfortunately, a lot of these buildings are occupied by government workers and they don't get sickness benefits, you know. So, um, yeah, what happens. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. They, they are enti they are entitled to get their full salaries for up to a year, mind you. Mind you, government is changing that without telling people. And when people go on sick leave, they stop paying them, so they don't get national insurance. They don't get government. They don't get um their salaries, so they get nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and and then also, mm -hmm. when you get sick in these buildings, and you have to stay, you have to stay at home. And they say that you're sick too long and they cut your pain and all kind of stuff, but you're getting sick from the conditions at work. Nobody yeah. cares that you get sick from work. They just care that they just care that you're in there and you're gonna get paid. So and it has a lot of repercussions for people because you know so many civil servants go home and dead shortly thereafter from all kind of illnesses that they pick up at work. I know of one lady years ago who complained about some at the old treasury building she worked she worked at the in the, tre, in the, in the treasury was it in the revenue which which revenue it was and they were saying that she was malingering she was playing the fool and because she went into one of these five rooms and she got something in her face and then her eye had this red mark in it and they were saying there's a little spot in here you know because then women sick all the time and you know when the people start to believe her mm -hmm. you know when at her funeral wow 
you know that's when the people and then pe all the people that were condemning her and saying that she playing the fool out at the moment from the crane because they're uh, but you know they, they, we, we don't we, we are a kind of people that always think the worst of other people so she was playing the fool they found that she wasn't playing the fool but then she actually died you know no, but, so. but you know boy that's terrible and and i think someone's here saying cas was easy he says sitting on this type of info rewater is a violation and flagrant breach of health and safety info that's breaking the law issue like this must be investigated because especially if they know if the government knows that something is wrong with the building and they don't tell the workers they did their test if, if what is said is true because we don't know but if what is said is true and that is what happened that is very 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 serious um you know that, that you're breaking the laws there the, the, the government is more interested in protect themselves from liability than taking care of the people of this country. They're more interested in saying, well, you know, if the people can link their illness to something at work, they can sue us and get a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So they find every which way. They find all kinds of problems with these buildings and they don't tell you because they don't want to link your illness to the actual conditions at work because then you got a, you got, you got a, a case in court and you can get some money out of them. So they're more interested in not paying compensation, legitimate compensation to people who got ill as a result of their negligence or their bad work or whatever. They're more interested in saving the money to get the people to help run their campaigns. Now, this, this, is, this is awful. And this, what is, what's amazing is that this is the same Minister of Labor who is in Parliament talking about the safety of, of workers and that they're there to ensure that workers' rights are upheld, um, and we are to believe them. And then you heard uh, Minister Strawn say this is the most transparent government that has ever been in the history of Barbados, but they, uh, they are withholding right information. This government is we're withholding information from employees about buildings, sick buildings. That is ridiculous. That is that is breaking the law. But they don't care as long as they don't have to actually then pay these people. And then when they're paying them, they're paying them in bonds if they do have to pay them. You don't, when you've got money, you want to travel overseas to get medical treatment and stuff, you can't get bonds. But this is what the government is doing. You, you said something there just now that, that triggered me to go and look back in my estimates again because um, I, I heard the Minister of Labor saying that the the Employment Rights Tribunal yeah. would, would get more assistance and all kind of thing, right? And they're going to do it. How come they're putting the estimates? If they're going to do it this year, they should put in the estimates. Mm. Unless and this is a serious matter, very serious. If you know that you have business to do, you should, because you want to limit the, the money that is shown in the estimates, you refuse to put them in the estimates. So the estimates are not are, are not a true statement of what of government intentions or anything like that. It, it, they just, and then they come back with a, with a supplementary. A supplementary should be used for things that you didn't anticipate. But you are not going to tell me that you anticipate these things. You are planning for them, but don't put them in the estimates. Yeah, that is that that is deceitful. Actually, you know, Caswell, um, I I listen. Sorry, I was listening yesterday. I think it was yesterday. No, yesterday when no, it was the first day the estimates, and I think hmm. the point was made that there was a reduction in in the allocation, and a comparison was made between the actual expenditure of last. The previous financial year because you know they show you actually in the first column yes. and i think minister humphrey was trying to suggest the leader of the opposition i didn't know to read the estimates which is the very argument you're making if you if you have spent this kind of money and you know what the situation is why why are you reducing and he mentioned a supplementary that's not supposed to be the way to do it i mean you do have those but that's you know 
but, but you, you have supplementaries when the things are not anticipated you didn't right. you you go and if you're planning something happens they had a storm or something you have mm -hmm. um something came up you had to go and fix the school you didn't want to fix any rent um troubling do a little thing find there's more work than is than you anticipated then you get a supplementary for these things but you don't go and get a supplementary for things that you have already planned not to do and then come you say you're going to do it but don't put the money in the estimates for it the mm -hmm. that means the estimates are understated because i remember looking at these estimates and showing and seeing that for instance you're going to get them more staff but you ain't getting more money so who, who what are you going to pair them with Buttons. all right <laughs> so i don't believe them i i have i you know I hate to say this, you know, but I think the government people are not truthful. I want to put it no higher than that. I, I, I don't want to call them liars. It does not sound too good. So I'm going to say they're not truthful. But you know that these estimates can't possibly be a, a, um, what government actually has planned. And they're understanding the estimates for whose benefit I don't know. And then, and you know, you, you can't do this to people. People expect you to come out and be honest. And I find that honesty in this place, especially with this government, is like hen's teeth. You know, hen, chickens, <laughs> chickens' teeth. Um, <laughs> but, they're scarce. but you know, I mean, I, I think. Uh, Mr. Miss, uh, I must ask this question. I didn't get to ask it off here. I'm, I'm not going to ask it. In fact, I will send you the, the message, Miss McLean, because I don't want to take um, Mr. Franklin off track um, with this labor, this, this these labor issues here um, in um, in Barbados. But um, you know, it is this this uh, Mr. Colin Jordan. Somehow he wants us to believe that um you know workers rights and workers um you know just employees rights and their conditions of work and health and safety and all of that that, that that's that's major for them but um, from what i'm hearing even looking at the comments you know um it's a lot of people are getting sick from these buildings calvin mckenzie says isn't there a standard barbadian civil service handbook can the government arbitrarily change these rules to suit their political agenda? Because that seems to be what is, is happening. They're just making it up as they go. Miss McLean, is there a civil service handbook? Um, there, I, is, there is, there is general orders. Yeah, yeah. And there is the Public Service Act and the Public Service Regulations. The, the Public Service Act was passed in 2007 by this same this same party when they were in power it was my fact one of the last pieces of legislation passed mm -hmm. by yeah. them before the election they, le they left office and they're breaching everything in it which is not a great piece of legislation but and what what we had before was far better but they wanted to deal with i think it was Anding Vidika at the time when they were they were arguing that the general orders mm -hmm. couldn't hold Anding Vidika because they were not binding in law they were just they were they were just um they were not rules for which you could penalize somebody right and so they went with the public service act mind you they still charge Pedro Shepherd and Alvin Bob under the same general orders that that they used that they said prior to 2007 that they could not use to bring charges against people and they're going to do them again, you know. So they do what they like. They 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 they, they, they um, you have a situation where people are asked, or, or rather, people are told that. If you work in the public service or you're appointed in the public service, you pay less national insurance contributions because you're not covered for sickness benefits or unemployment benefits mm -hmm. or severance. So, and the reason for that, it was, it was simple. 
Public officers were entitled to their full salaries for a full year. And national, so the, so if you can get a full salary, why would you then let national short be asking them to pay the um con pay a, a benefit to them as well? So, so you again say the six and two thirds percent for national insurance, and you again a hundred percent from government. So it would make no sense. So that is why Alabama decided that civil servants will not pay that component of your national insurance contribution that covered you for sickness benefits. And now, so because you are already covered for a year, national insurance pays you for 312 days, which for all intents and purposes is a year for national insurance purposes because they do not cover you for Sundays. National insurance do not pay for Sundays. So when you take the, the 52 Sundays or the thing, you get a 312 or something like that. So you get paid for 312 days from national insurance, mm -hmm. which is equivalent to a year. And now they are telling civil servants that we're going to take it from your vacation, we're going to take it from your, your um, salary. And what they have done is to come up with a situation where they are giving you extension of sick leave on, full, on no pay or on half pay. There is no provision anywhere in the laws of Barbados where you can give somebody an extension of sick leave on half pay or no pay. But they have been doing it for a while now, and I suspect because they have done it for so long, I know they realize that they realize that it is so now. They can't undo it because it's too much money we're going to pay back people. Mm. Because there's nothing in the law that allows them. The law says that if they give you sick leave, it's going to be on full pay. Full stop. General Order 5, 24, 1, 2, and 3. And those are the only things that cover sick leave in the in the public. But no, they give you under some other general law that does not cover sickness benefits or sick leave. So the, the government is treating workers very badly, not only in terms of their health when it comes to but in their, in their pockets. And this nuisance government is now coming out again with a new protection of wages act that will do more harm to the workers cause than anything else because i when i read it i said this is a protection of employment uh, employers act because you are finding ways to pay back employers money even though a worker might say but i don't owe you anything if there's a dispute the employer don't jerky hand your money because um he has the, he has to take right to pay you if he if you and the employer are odds over some money let a magistrate or a judge decide or a tribunal or somebody else decide you just don't come and take it out like that and what they're doing in this piece of legislation is to say now that they can take up the employer can take up a third of your money okay you're making a hundred dollars a week that's just what argument said yeah so that they, they can take out 33 dollars 33 cents but they used to go up in national insurance out of that. They used to go up in light bill out of that. So what are they expecting the worker to do? Previous to this bill, you can take out a third, but a, a third will include the national insurance and the other things that you have to pay because workers still have to eat. So they got to leave money. But this government ain't thinking about that and so. They're more interested in giving the employees back money mm -hmm. that, they might, that they might or might not be entitled to than looking out for the workers, their family. You, so you can take almost pay, pay income tax, national insurance, and then you got like bill and water bill and thing. The pay, you don't get no food. Especially when the, when the employer take a full third. So these are the things that Colin Jordan should be dealing with rather than dealing with I not um sending them my which my um change of address and that kind of thing. The, it is unfortunate, but the Minister of Labour is not fit for a purpose. He has no idea what he's talking about. And Labour, I'll, I'll give an example. Last Sunday on Brass Tax Sunday, I complained about they not have enough Labour officers and people can't make um, going 
to file their claims for unfair dismissal because the labor officers are there. And I made that previously, and the chief labor officer came out on the way there and denied it. And now he came out and denied it. Last Friday, one labor officer turned up for work. One. Not today. Last Friday. Right. One labor officer turned up for work. Can't deal with the demands of the people that are there. And sometimes, then, even if you got the full couple of people at work, some are in court dealing with matters with people. Because if you do not pay a worker vacation, or you pay him less vacation than he's entitled to, and the, the department contact you and say, well, look, you know you're wrong here, you got to pay the people the money and stuff, and you refuse to do that, you got you to put them in court. So the officers are in court, but some employers, because it's a criminal offense not to pay vacation pay or to pay less vacation pay than than the person is entitled to it's, it's about ten thousand dollars or some year in jail or something like that but the people end up paying in, in the end so they're in court they have to go to different places work places that have problems when you but if they come they haven't got nobody in there to work they ain't got enough people to do right. the job and they are come and, and 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 mind you, people. Every day I hear complaints about the labor department. Every day, and I have to tell the people who come to me, look, I think the obviously the labor department fault. They ain't got enough. Call brass starts call the nation, call somebody, and let them know what you're going through, because the minister can say that it ain't true when he knows full well that I am speaking one hundred percent gospel, you know, but. They are more interested in, in their, their type of transparency. This government is as transparent as mud. And they get, and, 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 and mind you, if they say so regularly enough and long enough, they think that people will believe them and believe that they're transparent. I can look here now for the Employment Rights Tribunal 266. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh... I tell you, I tell you, this is, it's, it's terrible to see what the government, the government is doing to its own people. The government is doing to its workers. And I want you to, everybody to think about that. Look at what, look at how they're treating us. Miss McLean, while, um, while Mr. Franklin looked for that, um, no okay. there, um, was the PM there today? No, I, the Prime Minister, I saw a photograph of the Prime Minister in St. Vincent and the Grenadines attending a meeting of CELAC. What's, what's the acronym? CELAC is the community uh, Latin America and Caribbean states. Uh, um, let me see if I can find it and, and send it to you. I think somebody sent it to me. But apparently she tra either traveled from Guyana to, to um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines um directly or came and then left almost on the same day probably somebody would meet at the airport with clothes no my my, <laughs> my you know i i, I don't even find it funny anymore i find that no, it, and it is it is not my my concern is that um a lot of these meetings in fact i noticed in the in the meeting the foreign minister of jamaica um she was attending that meeting and it the the prime minister might have gone to the the inter what well, call the intercession of the february meeting of heads of government but my recollection of the prime minister the same prime minister who would have been prime minister for the majority of the time that i was foreign minister in jamaica you know the jamaican prime minister and there were a lot of the meetings that he missed um Typically, with these meetings, you probably would find the foreign minister, um, you know, or somebody else, sometimes even at the level. I would have to look at the photograph again and see at the level of, uh, because some of the faces I still re I still recognize, um, you know, but sometimes you go at the level of even senior public, permanent secretary and, and a delegation. So I just find that it is um, a lot. I... Um, I can't, I'm trying to understand the rationale for attend. I mean, and certainly, as you said, Mr. Marie did indicate that essentially post independent 
since we have not had the Minister of Finance, Mr. 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 X estimates debate. He said not not you know. since 1951. I wrote it down that we've had a Minister right, of right. Finance, and he, he would have he he's pretty accurate in in his information. Yes. Yeah, that that would miss the miss the, miss the estimates debate, and this is what um, we in Barbados are are supposed to take and keep quiet. And if you can't say anything about it, but the truth of the matter is that we do not have a functioning prime minister. We do not. Barbados does not have a functioning prime minister, and I think we need to understand that and, and and register the disrespect that they this is the estimate and she is all over flying where something that that somebody else could um could could um you know substitute for her to re represent the country this is not acceptable and and when april first comes you know um she's going to get you know more allowances i think and, and she's going to get more uh, more salary how do we feel about that as Barbadians? Is it something that we should sit down and accept? Would you accept that from your, um, you know, you, you're working and this is what your boss does, right? And he's not there or she's not there. Decisions to be made. She should be paying oh, Barbados. She should be paying Barbados for the privilege of being our prime minister because she does nothing for Barbados, really. She's out there on the, on the global stage promoting herself. Nothing to do with what is best for this country. So, but well, yes, I'm sorry, Marcia. I found the thing I was talking about. When you, when you yeah. ask that question, when you say, I, I cannot help. Yeah, but, go ahead. Go ahead. What are you actually four The total um, sub program under um, Employment Rights Tribunal for 2023 24 was $403,597. Now, since they are going to beef up the program, beef up the, the tribunal, give it all these other things, get more staff, give it better conditions or whatever else. So you would expect that from $403,597, that this year's estimate would be a bit more. More, yeah. Right. Well... 2425 is $403,597. Oops, but that's what it happened last year. The same amount. Mm. So either these estimates are poorly done and, and rushed to be done so they couldn't do a good job or they are lying. And I suspect it is their line because they had a lot of years to do things about this this um the last chairman, Mr. Um Chris Blackman, he he was complaining. Even when he had to go and do research to write a decision, he had to go to KFL to go to the law library and get books and all kinds of stuff. The men got the, the, the um tools for them to work with yeah, up there. The total amount. 20, revised estimate 23, 24, $403,597. The estimates for 24-25, $403,597. What, what was that saying to you? That Colin Jordan is one of these magicians who can make more with less? Mm -mm. Yeah. They're not telling the truth. Or these Could estimates it? are not presented in accordance with what we expect estimates to be done but this, yeah. this, these are these these are more like guesstimates mm -hmm. they're guessing something i'm putting it there it doesn't make sense yeah you know? uh, you i know, hear a lot of noise not much so that's the rain it's pouring it's down rain. here rain okay that's lovely mm -hmm. I, I want some more if the rain fell last night i want some more up in st philip um um you know we are all about, you know, a big part of what we do is about education. And people want to say you know, we're, that this is, you know, we're political. Well, we're talking about politics. So if that makes us political, then that, that's it. 
Uh, but what we want to make sure is that we are nonpartisan, that we are fair, we are balanced, and we are truthful. All right? There is transparency and there are some others, and we're not doing that, right? So, but, you know, on the education side of it, M uh, Marsha introduced me to this book. Um, I know that probably um, uh, Ms. McLean and Mr. Franklin probably know about this book already. But when she talked about this book, I went and I started to check out the book. And um, the name of it is A Dying Colonialism. And especially, there are certain chapters in there that are very, very uh, relevant to us. But it's chapter five in particular. But I think this would be a great book, um, the Marcia Weeks show family, for us to read for the month of March. And, and so that we can, you know, Ms. Mopin have some discussions about it. And uh, Marsha is setting up a little, a healthy me to set up a little book club, right? Where we, okay. we go through books and, and, and really educate ourselves. I want to get a, a feedback from everybody else, so how they feel about it. Um, but um, she, she's suggesting um, when she comes on, she'll be able to, to help us to, to organize it. But we put this book on the website, the Marcia Week Show dot com. And those of you who can afford it, because, you know, if we're going to say a book a month, everybody can afford to buy a book a month. But there are particular chapters and so on that we would, um, within the copyright laws, that we would be able to put up um, for you to, you know, to send out to you um, if you are interested in reading with us. And then we're going to come on and, and at certain times in the month and, and discuss, um, the, discuss the books. Mr. Franklin, have you read this one yet? Dying Colonial. No, I, I, I haven't read it. I didn't even know it existed. <laughs> it, it's so very, I, very um, enlightening. The, the, thing, the thing with me is that you just can make me go out with banana books because I read all the time. And, you know, I, it's, a, it's a habit. My grandmother, um, only gift she ever gave me when I was a boy growing up, except good advice were books. You know, and so I, I, I was reading from the time I could start, I could, I, I start, start, read, I was reading all day, and I haven't stopped yet. Because yeah. I, I tell people, you know, that the problem with Barbados is that knowledge is in, in books, but it's got a lot of on the internet now, and our people don't like books. You know, if you want to hide something, if they put it in a book, well, I, you're, you're, not, you're not you know you're not gonna hide it from franklin <laughs> you're not gonna hide it from me you know you're but gonna, you're gonna find it you're gonna find it well people are saying here mr franklin um you know so far a few persons are saying they like the they like the idea i know that a lot of us are not reading as much as we should read but i tell you a, a big part of our emancipation is going to come to, uh, out of reading yeah, the TikTok videos allow us to watch something for two minutes, and we've gotten into that. And you know, Mr. Queen, my son, who is um, he's now 20, 20 years old, you know, he said to me, Mom, you know, that TikTok culture, you know, gives you a short attention span. He told me. Yes. You know, and he says, he says um, you, don't, you, you, you know, it affects your study. You don't study for long anymore. Nobody wants to read anything. And I think part of what's happening to us in Barbados, we sit down and people are telling us things. We sit down and the politicians, like they sit there in parliament and, and tell us these things and we don't go and, and, and look for it. You see, Mr. Franklin is there with a big book going through each night. He goes in the same little bag that they tease him about and he goes and he, <laughs> he takes the books off his shelf. No, no, very, very seriously. Miss McLean does her research. Kimar does his research. And they come on the show and i'm saying to us as barbadians let's get back into reading those of you who want a physical book there is a store in town um called things gospel and i spoke with them today and they are they if you call them if you go ahead and you call things gospel and the number i hope dave can put up the number they've given me um um, um permission to put up the number um, on the screen, and the number is 230-8134. 230-8134. 
that you can go to um, there to physically, you can order, call them to order your book, to have a physical book. I like a physical book in my hand. So I ordered, I told him I'm gonna order one. You too, Miss McLean? Of course, I have I have a huge collection of books. In fact, um, you know, my my niece's husband often used to come and he would sit down and look at some of them and and ask me, uh, "Do you read all the?" I said, well, "A lot of them I use for reference." You are correct, um, but I, I I find it difficult trying to to read on you know on 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 the screen. I prefer a hard book. Um, in fact, one of the things that I I, I I feel proud about people say children and didn't like to read and boys don't like to read. My son used to be an avid reader. I remember when he went to, to secondary school, uh, he went to Queens College, they had they had a library and he came home proudly after the first couple of weeks and he said, you know, the librarian said, I'm her best customer. But then I guess the guy started to tease him so he didn't borrow a lot of books from the yeah. library the other thing is i remember as a child you know sometimes children look to tear books i always i drilled it in his head and i would say it over and over again do not tear that books are precious yes. and for me in books i i read i read a lot i remember i look at the book there by franz fanon and i remember as a teenager well i had an older brother who was very much into to reading a lot of these kind of books and i remember the wretched of the earth or as they say in french le damne de terre, le damne de terre. Um, that's one of Franz Fanon's books. And and I think, you know, it's it's about reading. Talking about reading, I'm going to share it with, with you and in the chat where we have some of our, our, our um, you know, viewers. I came up, somebody said, shared with me two, two, two articles um, on critical thinking. Because that's another issue that I think that this um, social media culture not only are people having short um you know attention spans but a lot of people are not thinking about what they see and hear and read in other words you know um it, it says it says things gospel but I, you know i as as we, we say you think is something and you take it as the as the truth you don't question it you know um and so in what i like is that if you if you have a conversation about a book three or four people may come to two or three different conclusions about what the yeah. author is saying. Um, so, you know, and I think that dialogue is important, but very important is an ability to reason and think. I rem And it's something that stuck with me in relation to church. Um, some people will remember the um, former principal of Codrington College, Reverend Sion, and he became Bishop Sion Goodridge. And I remember at an anniversary service, it was at the cathedral. He said to us, he said, as Anglicans, we are supposed to be thinking Christians. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and some people get very upset when you try to reason about the content of the Bible, um, you know, and whatever. But I, I think as a people, we need to be thinking people, thinking beings, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. And so, so I, I think it's important. Um, reading, even, even I, I, I had a, I had a host family when I went to graduate school, I did my first, my master's programs in, in Ohio, at Ohio University. And when you went to the campus, the international students office, um, there were a number of people who opted to, you know, um, embrace and, and play host to, to foreign students. And the, the, there was a woman and her daughter. She was my host. That they were my part of the host family. I had, and we were walking around one weekend, and we passed. You know, I was in Ohio, rural kind of, rural kind of area. A lot of corn fields and that small university town, and we were passing one of these paddocks. You know, fenced around, and I started to recite a poem by Robert Frost, and it ended, "Good fences make good neighbors," uh -huh. and she looked at me quizzically, like. Where did, you, where did you learn that? And I told her, well, I did literature at school. And yeah. she said, but you know, he's an American poet and a lot of these children would not even know it. I said, well, for good or bad, I had to read Chaucer, Shakespeare, Sean O'Casey, you know, Jane, who, whatever. You know, we did all of those things. Nowadays, of course, we get a chance to read more of our own people. You know, whether it is Tom Clark or... 
um, uh, I'm just thinking of the of of a particular yeah. a quote a quote from George Lamin. It was a particular quote somebody somebody referred to one in the castle of my skin. Um, you know, so I think reading for me, well, we didn't have well, not I can't even say television. Okay, you know, these the what they call them no reality shows, which yeah. are so mindless. <laughs> you know, um, reading transported people like myself from from, and as this is why I told. The, the the woman as well. I can't remember her name now, but I said to her, you know, coming from a little island, one of the beautiful things of looking up to the ocean, you always wondered what was beyond there, mm -hmm. you know, and then you yeah. explore that within within the um within the 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 thing of the book the books. I used to go to the Bridgetown Library. I would borrow my sister's tablets, you know, the the cards to go to the Eagle Hall Library. I went to the library at school, and when I did not have a book, I read the dictionary or the Bible. I was reading was just <laughs> yeah, reading. but you know it's something that we have to get get back into and one of the things yeah. i believe that it can change a nation if we could start reading and and educating ourselves we we have been you know we've allowed ourselves we have allowed ourselves you know to be taught a, a certain way and, and 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 to be spoken to a certain way if you understand and we are where it's like we're underneath this cup and we are taking the, the dripping for whatever comes out of this tap and we've been doing it for years and years i think this is we need some re-education that needs to happen and we are going to start with this um book and you can go on the website and you um the marciawekshow.com you'll be able to see the book if we can put back the, the book on this on the screen and um you can get a physical book at um things gospel i'm going to ask um dr calvin mckenzie if you're still listening um um to reach out to me because you have some fantastic books i see you putting up on the screen this is dr calvin mckenzie um because we want to have each month we want to be recommending books um each month right so um i see somebody put up animal farm mr mckenzie um, put up Walter Rodney and Eric Williams and all of these different um, books. If you have suggestions for books, um, okay, um, Adrian Hines is saying a dying, dying colonialism is now on my Kindle. Now, some of you who are reading these books, like Adrian Hines and so on, I want to invite you on the show, right, Mr. Franklin? I want to invite some of you on the show to give us a book, a report, or a review of certain chapters, right? Um, every now and again, we have some of you come on and to tell us, to talk to us and summarize chapters to us. Let us learn and let us educate ourselves and let us get ourselves out of this, this um, you know, um, uh, it's, uh, who says, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. Yeah, let us emancipate ourselves. Theory Gittins is right, right. Blood in my eyes. That's another book. I'm not sure. I'm you might not be talking sure. About, you thought you might be talking about the government. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm we miss you. We miss but you, you know, too. the other side, Marcia, is that we also have to write. Yes. Um, and that's one of the things that when I remember when Kimar indicated that he had he had written um his book and i think he was working on a second one and, and that yeah. is so important whether it is something of that nature or fiction i remember in fact i asked her about it the other day i have a, a niece who who studied literature um and when my son was two and a half i remember because i was still at the university and i went to i went to on an exchange program to, to the in holland to the hague and he had gone with me with my big sister and she had given her mom that my niece it was her mother who accompanied me and, and brought my son back because they, they didn't stay the entire time but she had written a novel and that would have been my two and a half years old that's that's almost 30 years ago because my son is now will be 33 this year and she had written a book so she would have been very early teens or whatever so i told her the other day you must fish it out and read it it might seem you know that you were very young then but it was a fiction um, you know and you can you can you can you can edit it and do whatever but i i think from the perspective of persons now like yourself or caswell um 
Caswell has has a wealth of information on let's say industrial relations practice, the workings of government because of, of him being a public officer and dealing with with with, with um, you know as a as a trade unionist. I mean the other side of him and and, and I, I'm gonna blame the Marcia we show for this. I started to do some work on a on a book for my credit union when we were celebrating our fortieth and I have to finish that. Um, but you know, I, you get caught up in other things, but I think there's, there's a, a lot of what we do. We have all histories and memories, but I think we have to do a lot more documenting yes, um, yes. because there are issues. I mean, in your, in your, in your, in your areas of interest, um, uh, even working with the young people, the kinds of things that you do. I remember my son, when he was at nursery school, had an excellent nursery school teacher. And I found the way she taught and the things she shared. And I said to her, you know, you need to document these. You need to document these. And I remember one day she called me. Here was this North American, I think an American graduate student came to Barbados doing research. And next thing you know, she saw a lot of what, um, I have a little bit of news for Thierry, but now that you see that there. Um, um, yeah. She, the next thing you know, the, the, the visitor, the, the, the woman who came, you know, the graduate student, Went and she documented a lot of the, the ways that this teacher taught, you know, um, the smart investor theory. Um, you might be interested to know. I think I've shared it with Marcy already. My grandfather um, invested in Marcus Garvey's Black Star Liner. And I have I have I have the, the letter of acknowledgement and the share certificate as two of my most prized possessions. Yeah. And, you know, this is something, but let me understand. In fact, one of the things I shared with the youngsters from... Well, from one second, Miss McLean, before you go on. And just mm -hmm. to rem uh, remind us, it's 10, 16. We're here going along. Wow. Like, <laughs> yeah, we do the time. Let's have, I, I, um, I, I noticed, but I wasn't saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I can't somebody catch... I, I was trying to... Why, why the time was going along? I was listening to Miss McLean, but as well trying to catch these books and just think Terry getting to it 21. Listen, these things get me excited. Crime and punishment. I remember that. I He's don't know if I read it. writing about so many of these books on here. So um, I I'm going to call Terry. I know what I'm going to do. I know who Get his are. list. Get his list. Guys, can you capture the list for me, please? Mr. Calvin McKenzie, I'm giving you work. Dr. Calvin McKenzie, I'm giving you work. Um, and then there was somebody else that was seen very enthused. Can you capture? Or Sonia is, oops, I can't call that name. I can't call the people real name, sorry. Ramim, <laughs> Ramim, or you know who you are from St. Philip. If you can write out the names of these books for me, because I'm going to lose the, the chat um and and so on adrian hines get ready adrian hines to come on the show to in in two weeks to tell us to give us a review of a dying col colonial is it we'll tell you which chapters we're giving them homework all right i'm excited about this all right miss mclean um your one minute for your final word and then over to the general i didn't see kimar tonight okay um, i just yeah. well i is uh i hope he's okay and he's probably very busy but i I um I want to commend to, to persons as you said to read um I, I and, and and the process of reading also develop your skills of critical thinking but I also want people to start documenting their you know things of interest their life their life stories their you know experiences issues I think there's so much that we need to capture and become become more um of writers than than just consumers of some of the new new kinds of communication and materials out there yes yes somebody says here ramim is saying as i i'm sorry miss mcclain thank you for that just complimenting what you're saying it says as i suggested a few shows ago local viewers may avail themselves to the reference section in the public library yeah. or apply for external borrower use at ue and delve into the west in this collection very good ramim contact me please um i think that's great because that's something that um, was suggested by marcia as well that um those who don't have the money to buy these books 
um, then you can go to the library as well and, and get yeah. them. Mr. Mr. Franklin, any thoughts, please, before we I go? want to close on the same thing about reading and my own experience. I dive in a lot of things. And people ask me, well, can well, you know all these things? Mm -hmm. I said, what are you reading about? You know, the, the, you know the, the, it's as simple as that. I, I am not the brightest fellow in the world. I just read a lot of things, stuff, and I somehow I remember some of it, you know? And if you want to be able to, like, speak on all of, a lot of different topics, you read stuff. Me, yeah. I, I have never set foot in a law school, mm. right? Yeah. And people tell me I know the law. I quite read the thing. I tell them the law is not written in French. If it's written in French, I wouldn't understand it. It's written in English. I get when I read them. When it was in the Senate, because of my love for reading, you know, you got to build her and somebody pays and get the night before the one the better Then I get I sit on the rest of the night. You know, sometimes before I um I was um in the Senate or anything like that, I would be reading. And I'm sitting on my little recliner and I'm reading. And next thing you know, I see outside getting bright. I forget to go sleep. <laughs> you know, you know, and I go and say, Oh Lord, no, I got this. So I gotta go to bed um just after five or so and try to get a half hour sleep to come to work the next day because I forget to go to sleep because I was reading. And and that is where knowledge comes from. You don't go you don't go read because you want to pass an exam, just read because you want to read. Read because yeah. you want to forget knowledge. I if I show you my bookshelf, you'll be surprised. You got enough books about everything. You know, and yeah, it, it's just a question of, you know, having that desire. But unfortunately, when I was a little boy, we didn't have a lot to do. When you're done bringing the sheep and thing, you go and read, you know. So yeah, I, I had books and I read it by the lamp because we didn't have electricity when we first started out. We got my father put electricity when they got the commerce. He said, that's what me to my home, right? My father put electricity. You know, and, um, so, but you read, you read, you read, and you read some more. Because then, yeah, not much, but no, there's too many distractions, you know. Yes. Everybody got a tablet, everybody got a little something. And rather than read, they, they listen, and they listen to a lot of nonsense because you'll be surprised to see the things that people send me. And I don't want them. As a matter of fact, somebody sent me something one day, and I said to him, You don't know me, but enough to send something back to me. If you send it, let's take it to the police. So they're not going to their chat. <laughs> yeah. You know, right. I, I, I think, you know, Mr. Franklin, um, in lieu of time, look at we gone off. We talked about reading and we are 1022. What is going on? We need to get off of here. Um, you know, but I, I am. I am tell I, the time. Yeah, I, I am very, very pleased how people are responding um, about this. Uh, I'm very happy how people are responding. And this is a good way, Miss McQueen, to get the young people involved. But you know, once we start on that, we're going to start another show right now. So let us move on from there. And uh, Mr. Calvin McKenzie will give me a, a buzz uh, or send me a WhatsApp, Dr. Calvin McKenzie, and we will set out the books. And um, and I think people want Animal Farm the next, the next round. They want Animal Farm for April. And we will look at that and this, yeah. All right, guys. All good things about the end. Uh, we are ending tonight. And um, God bless How many you. we have tonight, Marcia? Yeah, we Perfect. have. We went up to about 1,200 tonight. Yes, it's Friday night. So I know how it goes. Thank you so much. Great. Hey, I wish I didn't like reading when he was younger. <laughs> <laughs> Very yes, good. Oh, very good, very good. Yes, we had over 1,200, over 1,200. Yes, thank you all. Thank you all so much um, for joining tonight. God bless you all. And it's a pleasure having you. And we will see you again on Sunday. Sunday. Bye-bye. God Have bless you. Evening. Great Saturday. Bye-bye. All right. Yeah. Bye-bye. Oh.